run the football. Quarterback Brandon Cox has been able to develop every week without the pressure being squarely on his shoulders because of that running game. So it is an old-fashioned slugout in the Southeastern Conference. Number 15, Auburn, takes on number nine, the Bulldogs. Kickoff is coming up next. College football prime time, brought to you by Olive Garden. When you're here, your family. And singular, raising the bar. So welcome back to Athens, Georgia. Let's take a look at the standings in the Southeastern Conference. And as we come down to just a precious few on the schedule, the Georgia Bulldogs at 5-1. and one, And with Florida having lost today, as we mentioned, they can clinch with a victory here tonight. What an upset by South Carolina. And this afternoon at Alabama, it was uh, LSU winning in overtime. The Auburn Tigers standing at 5-1, and one, but they do not control their own destiny as of right now. Let's go down to the sideline and check with the third member of our broadcast team. Holly Rowe, good evening. How are you? Hey, Ron. Thanks very much. Well, for Georgia fans, players, and coaches, today was an oddity. They're doing something they never thought they would. Cheer for the hated Steve Spurrier. The players for Georgia all got together at their hotel to watch that game, needing an upset by the Gamecocks over Florida to have a chance to clinch tonight. They had a big, huge cheer when that happened. This game has now taken on a real sense of urgency that you can sense here on the field and in the stand. For Auburn, they were cheering for the hated Alabama. Now, their wishes did not come true, but Tommy Tupperville told me just a short while ago he doesn't want his players to get wrapped up in all of that. They just have to concentrate on Georgia to make anything happen tonight. Okay, Holly. Holly might find this interesting at the hotel as soon as Florida won this afternoon or was upset, I should say, by South Carolina. I stuck my head out the door to see if I heard noise, and there were cheers all around the hotel. So there were a lot of people pulling for Steve Spurrier and the South Carolina Gamecocks this afternoon. Kickoff, and this one is underway. Going to come down three yards deep, and Aruba Shadu is not going to bring it out. So let's talk about the starting quarterback, Brandon Cox, the sophomore out of Trustville. Bob, we saw him in his opening game of the year against Georgia Tech, and he has come miles since then, hasn't he? Ron, this guy may be the most underrated quarterback in the Southeastern Conference right now. As we see a penalty here on the opening kickoff. So they will accept the penalty. Penn Wagers, the referee tonight. Penn Wagers, and uh, they're going to step off the five. During the kick, there were only three kicking team players on the side of the kicker. Rule requires there to be four players on the kicking team on the side of the kicker. Real re kick five yards further back. So it gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the quarterback, Brandon Cox. And, Bob, if you had to say, when you look at his report card and if you were grading him, where has he improved the most? Well, the biggest thing, four interceptions in his first game as a starter against Georgia Tech. Only two interceptions since that time. And so much credit to Al Borges and the offensive staff at Auburn. We mentioned the commitment to the running game. Run and play action is the Auburn offense. They've taken the pressure off Brandon Cox, and he's gotten better run every week. Good look at Al right there on the sideline. Brandon Couture, the redshirt sophomore out of Lawrenceville, is uh, set to kick it off again. And Devin Aromashadu, one of the deep men, along with Trey Smith. Here's Couture, arm of the air, and now we're underway. No flags on this one. And this one is returnable. Aromashadu from the one. 15, 20, and he gets out, breaks a tackle, and he's finally stopped at the 25. It's about four yards shy of what he averages. Well, this uh, this is not a good average as far as the start. <laughs> two, uh, two attempts at uh, getting this ball game underway, and two flags. Seventh season as the head coach, Tommy Tuberville. You see his record, 69%. Four and two career against Georgia since he's been at Auburn. I can tell you this, the Auburn Tigers, though, in their last 11 trips to Sanford Stadium here on the campus of the University of Georgia, they have won nine of those 11. As you look at Mark Rick, 
fifth season as the head coach. 49 victories for him and an 81.7 winning percentage. Short drop to throw, quick out. Got it complete at the 10-yard line to Anthony Mix. He's going to be gang tackled, but it is a gain of six yards. Now let's take a look at our Garmin starting lineups. First of all, on offense for the Auburn Tigers, Kevin Aroma should do. Little bit of a turf toe. They got to have him healthy tonight because on both returns, as you could see, and catching the ball, he is very, very dangerous. With the offensive line, this probably the most underrated or overlooked part of their team. Marcus McNeil, the leader of that group, that's a really fine offensive group. First running play, we're going to see Kenny Irons puts a head down, and I believe Kenny will have the initial first down of the night, which gives us an opportunity to take a look at the starters on defense for the Georgia Bulldogs. Kendrick Olson injured a knee. He's been out for a couple of games. He's back. That return may be, well, it's almost as big as having Shockley back, just his presence, him being there. Three outstanding linebackers. Tony Taylor got to step up tonight as the coaches say they need a big one out of him. And in the secondary, Greg Blue, the big hitter. Paul Oliver starting tonight because of an ankle injury to Tim Jennings on Thursday. Irons hit behind the line of scrimmage and he's going to be stopped for a loss by Quentin Moses. And Ron, you mentioned Auburn has won nine of the last 11 games here at Georgia, which is remarkable. But keep in mind, Auburn with 18 players on their roster from the state of Georgia. <laughs> Georgia with only one player from the state of Alabama. So the homecoming much bigger for the Auburn, Auburn Tigers here in their home state of Georgia with 18 players. Absolutely right. Second down and 12 with the loss of two. That's Cole Bennett, one of the tight ends in motion. Cox sets to throw great protection. That's a rumor should do, and he'll have him close to the first down. In fact, they'll give him a spot of around the 28-yard line, tackled by Greg Blue. I think that this, the thing you see right away, Ron, with Brandon Cox, how calm he is, what a presence he has. He is a pocket passer. The second thing you see, not great arm strength, but extremely accurate. At least two of two to start the ball game tonight for a total of 17 yards. There are his numbers, 59.3%, 1,800 yards, 12 touchdowns, and six interceptions. Cooper Wallace in motion this time, but it's Irons hurdling first down to Auburn. Tackle made by Tony Taylor, the middle linebacker. And there is a flag down. We had big Marcus McNeil, number 73, involved with the Georgia player out there late. After the play is over, personal foul, 94 on Georgia. Also, personal foul, 73 on Auburn. By rule, these penalties are offset. The play gained a first down. And Ron, we talked about Auburn pulling for Alabama today you know talking to both these coaches and these staffs they consider this a friendly rivalry I sense a lot of respect for these two football teams and right away there early you see them kind of getting back and forth with each other but I think respect was a key word we heard all week in regard to this rivalry there's so many crossovers as far as guys who have played at one school and are now coaching at the other and vice versa Here's Irons, nothing outside, tries to cut it back into the middle. Tony Taylor is right there, and what the coaches said had to happen is happening. Two tackles for him already. I guess in talking about those crossovers, one of the biggest ones, you go back to Pat Dye, who was an All-American here at Georgia. You're exactly right. And we look at Auburn's keys to success, win time of possession. They've been phenomenal. Run and play action is their game, and stay out of third and long ball control and run the football for Auburn on first down play action they swing it out here's Irons 30 35 40 45 going to be collared and knocked out of bounds at the 45 but that is a gain of 15 Tony Taylor with his third tackle but way downfield 
and we talk about this big athletic line of Auburn. Watch number 76, Duckworth, right there in the open field, gets an excellent block, and then the straight ahead north and south speed of Kenny Irons. But Ron, an athletic offensive line for Auburn. Irons going down hard. <laughs> A little conversation with the uh, Georgia players over there on their side of the field, but they move the sticks again now from the 45-yard line. They'll give it to him again. Right guard, not much doing. Stepping up immediately was Demario Mentor, the senior out of Stone Mountain, Georgia. We talk about this Auburn offense, number one in the Southeastern Conference in total offense, 435 yards a game. And, Ron, they put on a clinic last week against Kentucky with drives of 80, 80, 80, 80, and 75. I don't know if I've ever heard of that in major college football. Well, you see how they're starting off here tonight. Ninth play of the drive. Conservative and safe plays for the young quarterback. Play action here. They'll roll him out. Looking for Obamano, and he just overthrows him. You can, he could tell that the man coverage was adequate enough as Charles Johnson was chasing him and he just threw it away to make sure they didn't come up with a turnover. An excellent coverage by DeMario Mentor, the corner playing off man, closes on it. And again, a good decision by Brandon Cox. So it's third down. The line to make, they've got to take it across midfield. You see the yellow stripe right there on the 45 of the Georgia Bulldogs. Mix in motion, straight in the pocket. Here comes the pressure. Middle screen, the ball is caught, 50-yard line, spinning around is Courtney Taylor, and he is going to be close to the first down. Take a look at Al Borges. Another excellent call, Ron, of taking the pressure off the quarterback, Brandon Cox. Really, that's a basically a yeah. running play right there and missed tackles by Georgia. But excellent job since the Georgia developing this young quarterback Brandon Cox. You know actually I called it a screen when I saw the offensive lineman releasing a little bit but that was not the case. You're exactly right. They just had him in traffic ran his pattern and picked up the first down. Got a man wide open here and that's the tight end Cooper Wallace at the 40 inside the 35. Greg Blue finally in the tackle but it's a gain of 14 yards. Holly Rowe let's check back down on the sideline with you. So guys, offensive coordinator for Auburn, Al Borges, told us something interesting this week. He said he has found when teams are coming off a of bye week like Georgia is, that their players get so tuned in to one thing that he thinks that they can have some disinformation here to confuse the defense. He said they're so tuned in to, hey, if Auburn does this, that means they're going to do this. So he's purposely trying to mix it up here early to get Georgia wondering what happened to all their tendencies. Well, Holly, it's a great point because he certainly has them off stride right now. Pass out to Irons incomplete. And in fact, Irons went through the hole. <laughs> and I thought, boy, if they'd given him the football, he might still be running. It was Jarvis Jackson who was trying to cover on the play. But that'll slow down the momentum just a little bit. And it really is remarkable when you think of the first round draft choices missing from this Auburn offense. Two running backs in the top five picks that they are more productive than they were a year ago. And a first round quarterback drafted last year. 12 plays and you see the yardage right there so far. Georgia crowding at the line of scrimmage with the backers and the corner on top. Let's see if they come. Nope, they stay at home. They look for the running play. Irons has five, has ten. He's off. Touchdown, Auburn Tigers from 30 yards away. And Joe Colt, the center, with a paving block. We said in the open, this may be the best offensive line in the country. And look at the effort right here by the undersized center, Joe Cope, staying on this double-team block and the north and south explosion by Kenny Irons. And Bobby, he actually got a second block. He released off the double team inside and went down and picked up someone in the secondary. Great hustle by Cope. 
John Vaughn with the extra point attempt. It's up and it is good. Let's take a timeout. Whoa. Auburn takes the opening kickoff and marches strongly down the field. They have taken the lead seven to nothing. Auburn on top, seven to nothing. Great effort by the center, Cope, Bob. You talk about little things win football games, and Joe Cope with great effort. First, you're going to see him on Kedrick Golston, the nose guard. Now, Ronnie goes to the second level, and right here, he gets the block on Greg Blue to spring Kenny Irons. 90 yard drive by that offense, and Ron, I said it in the open, this may be the best offensive line in college football this year. You know, they're saying officially 92 yards on it, so that is the longest of the year. Bob Davey, 13 plays, 5 minutes and 15 seconds. Clark with a kickoff. And he's going to boot this one out of bounds, so Georgia will take it over at the 35-yard line, and you'll hear the roar from the crowd because number three is healthy again, injured the knee against Arkansas, and then missed Florida. And Ron, the most frequently asked question the last three weeks in the state of Georgia, how's the knee? You don't even have to say the name, just how's the knee? We're about to find out right now. Left knee injury in the Arkansas game. DJ Shockley back after the open date last week. You know, and make no mistake about it, he has not been quiet about the fact he does not like wearing a knee brace, but they were getting him one that was a little less heavy and you see it on his left knee there we'll see if he is encumbered when he you know tucks the ball and runs got to keep it on the ground with thomas brown breaks it open five ten cut it off at 17 yards will herring finally makes the tackle here are the garmin starting lineups for the bulldogs of georgia the specialist Leonard Pope, he's the go-to guy anytime they've got to have a situation. 6'7, 250. Not many folks stop him. The offensive line, Max Gene Gillis. Outstanding right guard at 6'4, 340 pounds. First throw. Shockley got it complete. And the man I was just talking about, Leonard Pope, the huge tight end, will go for 15 yards. And just like that. They are into Auburn territory and another first down. Georgia wasting no time. Going to hand it off again. Thomas Brown spinning around for about three yards. Travis Williams, the middle linebacker, is there to make the tackle for the Auburn Tigers. And Georgia opening up with a no huddle offense right now taking advantage Ron of that open date they had last week this is something new for the Georgia Bulldogs right now so we talked about what Al Burgess said and you know what's good for one is good for the other they both had a little thing in their side pocket there right second down and seven Shockley steps up drills it incomplete probably should have been caught by Sean Bailey so let's go back to the lineups here. For Auburn on defense, T.J. Jackson. The opposing coaches just kind of grimace when you bring up his name. He is a tough competitor in the middle. Outstanding group of linebackers. Travis Williams, a really good one there in the, the middle. And in the secondary, Will Height. Well, he really has improved. Gandy, Herring, and David Irons out of Dacula, Georgia, making up the remainder of the secondary. Third down, they need the 25. Shockley throws for the end zone. Kenneth Harris has it in and out of his hands and in into one of the watering hoses that they use on the field. <laughs> And a problem all season for Georgia has been inconsistent play by their wide receivers. Here you're going to see Kenneth Harris. Whoa. Excellent throw by DJ Shockley. On third down run, Sean Bailey dropped a short completion. The Georgia receivers inconsistent all year. 49-yard attempt coming up by Brandon Cattu. Ball is down. He's got plenty of distance. And he's good. His longest in his career is 58 yards against Louisiana Monroe. That one, 49. Let's take a timeout. 7-3, our new score. We'll be right back. 
Well, uh, we get to meet a, a lot of different people on the road. The guy driving the truck is Big Dog, and this is his bevy of dogs. Mike Wood driving right there. Followed us into the parking lot at the hotel last night. And Bob and I got out and stood around and petted bulldogs for about half an hour. Well, I learned something interesting. Big Dog told me they're actually trying to breed size back into these bulldogs, Ron, because we've actually bred them down because in the United States, everybody wants lap dogs. Yeah. So they're trying to get some size back into these bulldogs in this country right now. <laughs> and the people here in Georgia don't want Ugga to be a lap dog. Aroma should do on the return. 15, 20, that's excellent coverage. Whoa, he gets pounded out of bounds by Greg Blue on the special teams after a return of about 23. I have to finish the story about the Bulldogs now. Our guy Big Dog's getting him up to 85 pounds. He thinks that's the optimum weight. Ugga right there is about 65 pounds, so he's he's a little disappointed. Well, it's, we've just gone through the hot part of the season, too. <laughs> I mean, he'll put on a little fall weight here, yeah, won't he? There you go. <laughs> Eight minutes and 23 seconds showing on the clock in his opening period in what has been a very fast-paced ball game. Kenny Irons comes back in at tailback, number 23. They pitch it to him, back into the short side of the field, blocker in front, Grubbs breaks it out for 15, and now let's say 18 yards. It's Trey Battle finally tripped him up, but I'll tell you, both of these teams have said to heck with defense. And what I say about Kenny Irons, Ron, he is hungry. He is a hungry back and runs downhill. Keep in mind, this guy got beat out three or four weeks ago by Brad Lester. Brad Lester gets hurt, and Kenny Irons is a hungry back that doesn't want to give that job away now that he has it. Listen to this average. Seven carries, 52 yards. That's over seven yards per try. Play action to him. Throws the pass complete to Cooper Wallace, the tight end. And they still tussle a little bit. He and Demario Minter over on the far sideline, which is the Auburn bench. But you see Auburn's game run and then play action. So dependent on first and second down, Ron. Positive yardage so they stay out of third and long. You know, and I also understand what you're saying. One of the things that has helped the maturation of Brandon Cox is getting that running game going. Here's Irons again. This time hit at the line of scrimmage. Quentin Moses again with penetration, stopping a play either for a loss or behind or at the line of scrimmage. Quentin, a junior out of Athens, played at Cedar Shoals, 6'5", 248, a junior. And this Georgia defense, particularly the front seven, a lot of injuries. They're probably as healthy right now as they've been all season. Crowd comes to their feet. It is third down. Auburn needs the 47 to keep this drive going. Gonna throw it. Intercepted at the 50-yard line. Paul Oliver, the young man who was substituting for Tim Jennings tonight, who was an injured ankle, comes up with an interception. How big is that? And Auburn, Auburn is going to bring the big wide receiver mix in motion and come back out on a little option route. And Paul Oliver, who gets the start tonight for Tim Jennings, the ball terribly thrown by Brandon Cox. Ron, probably miscommunication between the receiver and the quarterback right there. Big turnover early in this game. Well, if Oliver was looking for confidence to open this evening, that certainly should have been a shot of confidence right there. They scrimmage from the Auburn 47. Chocolate wants to throw deep. Got his man. 25-20. Muhammad Masakwai. It's good for 32 yards and a huge first down. Excellent play call. They fake the reverse. DJ Shockley right here fakes the reverse, and they give Muhammad. Massaqua on the crossing route, and this has become the go-to receiver for this young Georgia wide receiver core. But excellent play call, Ron. When we saw them early in the year, the coaches raved about him and said he is a, a player with a huge amount of topside. 
He showed just now why he is becoming the go-to guy. Pass over the middle, caught at the end zone line, and gathered in at the one is Leonard Pope. And that's the unstoppable one we talked about on the starting lineups at 6'7", 250 pounds. And, Ron, I think D.J. Shockley's knee is okay. Watch the big 6'8", <laughs> tight end right here. He's all of 6'8", to catch that. And then the hand-eye focus and control to be able to take that football in. That is a 6'8", 250-pound tight end on that catch. First down and goal from about a yard and a half away. Leaping at the line of scrimmage. There's nothing there for Danny Weir. Well, the linebackers were right there. They were leaping at the same time, led by Antarius Williams, the junior out of Columbus, Georgia. You have to think, with Max Gene Gillis at 6'4", 340, <laughs> And Dennis Rowland at right tackle at 6-9, 309, that the right side, or wherever they are, this time they flipped them, that that's where they would go. And Leonard Pope goes to that strong side. That's a lot of beef on that left side or strong side of that offensive line. Auburn wants a timeout. Five minutes, 41 seconds left in this opening quarter, and we'll hold it right here. Ron, we mentioned the strong side of Georgia's offensive line. They don't play a right guard, right tackle. They play a strong side guard, strong side tackle. They always stay together, and we look at that size. Gene Gillis, 6'4", 340. Roland, 6'9", 309. And Pope, 6'7", 250. And probably the guy that's been developed the most is Roland, the big offensive tackle. This guy right here, Gene Gillis, probably the number one guard that will be picked think, in the NFL he draft. Be, huh? He is that good. You know, and the interesting thing, you remember we talked with him the last time we were in town, and it, you talk about a kid that is really driven and has so much want to, and he just said, you know, that that's my desire. I want to be the first guard taken in the NFL draft. And how about these numbers? Bench is 530 pounds, a 62 jacket, he is a strong, strong guy. I think they're going to go to the left right here. Well, they got a lot of folks over there. That's Milner in motion. Going to take it back to the right and hit behind the line of scrimmage. That is a great job of penetration by Gunn. Number 48, the junior out of Alexander City, Alabama. Got the penetration, and boy, then he got a lot of help from friends. Maybe they should have gone to the left. <laughs> <laughs> Tried to fool somebody that didn't work. One of the things you find out quickly in this conference, if you're going to run anything that goes east and west, you better be quick. And now we may find out how D.J. Shockley's leg is, that left knee run, because this is an obvious quarterback run situation. Danny Ware is the tailback. Mentor again in motion, or Milner, I should say. It's Pope who splits out to the left. Nope, not going to throw the fade. He's just going to throw it away. No, Pope is there, and he makes the catch for the touchdown. And everybody around Georgia football wanted to know, where's Leonard Pope? Only one touchdown catch this year. Last year, Ron, he had five straight games in which he had a touchdown catch. Leonard Pope is back. Or for the world, it looks as though he was just going to throw that one away. And Big Leonard went it up and gathered the touchdown. 10-7, to Georgia goes on top. The two with the extra point as you take one more look at Pope. All 6-7 of it. Welcome back between the hedges, Auburn, Georgia. Number 15 in town to take on number 9. Look at this scoring drive. Five plays, 47 yards. Two minutes and 26 seconds. He's three of three for 50 yards. Speaking of uh, Mr. Shockley, I don't think there should be any questions about his knee to you, Bob. <laughs> Here's the kick. A Roma should do from the one-yard line. Got a wedge right in front of him. Cuts it up into the middle. And will bring it back to around the 26-yard line, tackled by Jarvis Jackson. And let's go back and look at the touchdown. Let's check this left knee of DJ Shockley's out. 
He's able to keep this play alive because of his scrambling ability. The knee looks fine. And then big Leonard Pope, who actually lined up as a wide receiver. Ron, this guy was a free safety in high school. That's frightening. <laughs> that is frightening. Oh, boy. I'm sure he tackled some kids in high school with just his stare, his intimidation. <laughs> he willed them down. Auburn very good in their opening drive. Let's see if they settle things down. Here's Irons. Look at him continue to drive. That's going to be almost nine yards in the play. Tackled by Tony Taylor, which I think is his fifth stop already. This fellow, for not a real big man, Bob, is, boy, what a great second effort. I'll tell you, Kenny Irons runs as hard as any running back in the country. And let me ask you something. Is this a Southeastern Conference game, or is this a Pac-10 game, <laughs> the way these offenses have come out here early in this football game? I don't think anyone expected this much offense this early in this game. Well, you see his numbers in the last four games, averaging 151 per ball game. Puts a head down. He's going to move the sticks again. Check down on the sideline. Holly Rowe, what do you got for us? Well, guys, Kenny Irons had a chance to start, and he's made the most of it. But one thing that the coaches are concerned about are the workload. He had nearly over 20 carries in the first half of last week's game alone. So they actually forced him to take some time off practice this week. Kenny didn't want to do it, and the coaches said, look, we need you fresh. You're taking such a pounding out there. But he's such a hard-nosed guy. He didn't want to sit out practice. But he is certainly fresh tonight, thanks to the coaches' good judgment. Okay, Holly. And I and for those who don't know, the first two years of his collegiate career, he spent at South Carolina. Here comes pressure, and they will sack the quarterback, Brandon Cox, and drop him for a loss of about six yards, and that's Jeff Owens, a highly touted freshman. A true freshman, Jeff Owens, and right here, you see, they try to chop him at the line of scrimmage. Number 69, Ben Grubbs, and they love this true freshman lineman. They say he is the total package, Ron. I'm talking about Jeff Owens. 6'3", 280 pounds, and you can see he bounces around pretty well. Second down, officially a loss of seven on that play, and they give it back to Irons. Has five, has ten, counted off at about, mm, that's going to be 11 yards in the play, Ray Gant coming over from his defensive tackle position. Ray's out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And Ron Holly with that story on Kenny Iron saying the coaches had to keep him out of practice. I'll tell you why. He won that starting job. He knows Brad Lester is back healthy. He saw Tristan Davis last week, eight carries for 162 yards. He knows about those tailbacks behind him. <laughs> He wants to keep that job. That's why he stays out on that field and wants to practice. And I understand that tonight we will see Brad Lester in this ballgame. Third down for the Auburn Tigers, and they need to take it to the 47. Georgia 10, Auburn 7. This play is going to be whistled down. Prior to the snap, delay of game on the offense. Penalty, five yards. Down remains third. Interesting to see what the play call will be right here by Al Borges. Keep in mind, Brandon Cox with the big interception run on the last series was led to the Georgia touchdown. Third and 12, you'd like to take the pressure off that quarterback right now. Well, that's Anthony Mix that they're resetting from the right back over to the left. On third down, here comes Blitz. And they throw the screen back into the other side. Irons, 40, 45, 50. And I'll tell you, he not only has the first down, you can add about 13 more yards onto it. A gain of 22. Paul Oliver finally makes the stop. And you had to think, Ron, that the screen was coming. Again, look at Big Duckworth out here in the open field. What a size difference. Excellent call by Al Borges. An excellent job up front by Big Tim Duckworth at 330 pounds out in front of that. Says 315, but he is 330 pounds. Leon Hart started in that position last week because Duckworth had dinged a knee, but as you can see, he is uh, much, much better. Cox going to go on top, throwing the long ball, almost intercepted by Trey Battle. Thank you. 
Excellent coverage right here by Paul Oliver. We're going to get an out and then an up the field trying to work on Paul Oliver getting his first start tonight. But boy, that is really good, confident defensive play. He wasn't close to being fooled, was he? Was not going to take the bait. Paul, the redshirt sophomore out of Kennesaw, Georgia. Play clock down to three. Gives it to Irons. Safety comes up, misses the tackle, and then he gets double teamed down hard after a gain of three. Trey Battle led the group of Georgia defenders. Auburn, a zone blocking team. You look at Trey Battle right there, really undersized as a safety at about 167 pounds. That was an excellent tackle right there. Not many safeties run in the Southeastern Conference at 5'11, 165 pounds. Here's another third down situation. It was a screen that bailed out the Tigers last time. Let's see what they come up with here. Here comes pressure, trying to step up and is going to be stopped back at the original line of scrimmage. Marcus Howard is there to put the tackle on him. Georgia with a defender down on the play. And that's uh, Kendrick Goldston. Well, tomorrow night, ESPN has the latest chapter in one of the NFL's fiercest rivalries. Pittsburgh Steelers look for a win to keep pace in the AFC North as they welcome the Cleveland Browns to Heinz Field. Browns and Steelers tomorrow night, 8.30 Eastern on ESPN, also available in high definition on ESPN HD. Coverage begins 7.30 with the NFL primetime presented by Miller Lite. You see Kedrick Ghost, and you see that big cast on his left elbow he had elbow problems has been held out but it looked like he had some type of a leg injury right there and you mentioned Willie Martinez the defensive coordinator said he is as important to their defense as getting DJ Shockley was back for their offense so let's take a time out it's the end of the first quarter Georgia 10 Auburn 7 back for the second period after this Welcome back to ESPN's College Football Primetime, presented by Polaroid. I'm Ron Franklin, along with Bob Davey and Holly Rowe from Athens, Georgia. And our scores, we begin the second quarter. Georgia 10 and Auburn 7. It has been non-stop action so far. You see the series history. 109th meeting between these two. Auburn leads at 54-48 at 8. Goes back a long time, my friend. First punt of the night by the Auburn Tigers. Very high. Flowers with the fair catch. Whoops. Held on to it. Well, let's check in for a Sports Center 30 at 30 update. All right, Ron, all SEC all the time on the 30 at 30. Only two unbeaten teams remain in college football. LSU beats Alabama in overtime. Jamarcus Russell, a Mobile, Alabama native, finding Dwayne Bowe for the winner, 16-13. And Steve Spurrier leads South Carolina to victory over Florida. A bit ironic that he had Gatorade dumped on him in celebration. Sports Center coming up after the game. ESPN News all the time. Okay. Uh need to correct you that's now Gamecock aid that's what they call it in Columbia anyway Craig Lumpkin in the ball game and he was the ball carrier just now sophomore out of uh, Lithonia Georgia 6 1 211 pounds had a knee and missed the 19 or the 2004 season gain of a couple second down and long and Shockley wants to throw on second down out in the flat got Milner the other tight end who lines up on the other side of Leonard Pope and Terrius Williams put a stop on him. Ron, we look at the Georgia Keys offensively. I think number one's really critical play loose. And I think the fact that Florida lost today and there is some margin of error for this Georgia football team really helps you and they can play a little looser. 
of this running play. Lumpkin bounces back at he tried left guard. There was nothing there. And then the pursuit came in a hurry. Wayne Dickens polished him off. Senior out of Lakeland, Florida. So that uh, short yardage situation, they did not pick up the first down. Crowd didn't like the spot, so it's fourth down. And here comes the kicking unit off. Now this will be the first punt for Georgia. So each team waiting until the second quarter before either has to punt the ball away. And Joe Tereshinsky is the personal protector on the punt team. You see him there, number 13 for Georgia. Keep in mind, he was the starting quarterback against Florida. Always nervous on defense in these situations, Ron. Edie Kelso, a junior out of right here in Athens, is the punter. Trey Smith is the deep man. And here's the boot. This is a high, good-looking driving spiral. All the way back to the 32-yard line, and a fair catch is called for. 46 yards of the punt will take a timeout. Georgia continues to lead by three. Auburn breaks the huddle as we return to Athens. Good look from Skycam from right up over their offense. Kenny Irons, number 23, the tailback. They give it to him. Big opening left side, 40, 45, 50. And he is all the way down to the 48-yard line of Georgia. Game track, Kenny Irons. You're going to have to add this last run on. 114 yards and a touchdown in the first quarter alone. The return of D.J. Shockley, 5 of 7, 71 yards and a touchdown. And here's that TD right here to the large one. Number 81 is tight in. Pope. Irons again bounces it outside on the left. <laughs> He's like a heat seeking missile as he goes inside the 45. Jarvis Jackson finally stopped him. And what you get nervous about if you're Georgia, first of all, Georgia's an excellent defensive team, number eight in the nation in total defense. But that time they brought the safety up into the box, Greg Blue. And Kenny Irons ran by Greg Blue. Got a check here. We had him at 117 at the end of the first quarter. Total yardage now. Over 100 yards rushing. That was a combined total in the first quarter of both rushing and passing. He's going to be close to another first down here, but they'll spot him about a yard and a half short as Jarvis Jackson with still another tackle on the play. We thought this would be a typical. Southeastern Conference game. Two great defensive teams. Georgia number eight, Auburn number nine in the country. But right now, Ron, it's the play of these offensive teams. Third down. Auburn has already had a number of these tonight, and they've been very successful. They need to take it just a yard and a half to hold on to the football. It's Cooper Wallace, the tight end in motion. And that's where they're running, right behind his block. And as you can see, the yellow line, he crosses it. He'll have the first down for the Tigers. And the stop made by Tony Taylor, number 43. And you add the fullback, Jake Slaughter, to the mix. He's going to get an excellent block right in here. And also the tight end, Cooper Wallace, as the lead blocker right there. Excellent design to that play right there. Kenny Irons gets a breather, and it's going to be number 22, Trey Smith, the junior out of Venice, Florida, who will check in 5'10", 200 pounds. He was the starter at the beginning of the year. Pitch back comes to Courtney Taylor. He's looking to throw the ball, fakes the throw, and then is going to be tackled after a one-yard game. That is an outstanding defensive play by Mentor. Reese Davis, speaking of outstanding players. What do you That's some kind of introduction there, Ron. This is Arizona State and UCLA. Rudy Carpenter, who stepped in at quarterback for the Sun Devils, finding Terry Richardson. They had another look at this play, reviewed it, ruled a touchdown. Those two teams tied at 28, just about to go to halftime. Iowa State's on top of Colorado. The Buffs are trying to win their way into the Big 12 championship game. Ranked teams having trouble with unranked teams today, Ron. <laughs> that seems to be the trend the last couple of weeks. 
Second down and long. You can see Brandon Cox with an audible. Play clock is at three. Going to hand it off to Trey Smith, and Trey will only have a couple of yards. Going to be third down and long. Mentor from that cornerback position making another tackle. And now you see number 28, Brad Lester, the redshirt freshman out of Lilburn, Georgia. He will come at a tailback. 5'11", 190. Seven touchdowns for him. Injured his groin against Arkansas and was out for a couple of weeks. And you have to wonder, is it a screen situation? Maybe get the football in Brad Lester's hands right here, Ron. Well, he's in there blocking, and the quarterback is being sacked. Brandon Cox is knocked down by Gerald Anderson. And you see how important it is for Auburn. We've talked all night about staying out of third and long situations. Auburn number one in the Southeast Conf Southeastern Conference in third down conversions, 50%. But the reason, Ron, they're number one, they don't normally get in third and long. Yeah. And right there, you see, that is not their game. <laughs> oh boy wow so they stopped the play and in case you didn't hear it Auburn had called a timeout they're going to get that one over again overs when we come back back Auburn did get a timeout called so they get that third down play over once again Georgia has made their defensive changes. Auburn leads the SEC in third down conversions. They're four of six tonight. They got to take the ball down to the 27 yard line. Quick pass and it is incomplete. Aroma Shadu is turning around saying, I thought there was pass interference. And the official said, have a good Saturday night. <laughs> Cody Bliss. <laughs> Coming on to the field of play. John Vaughn, I beg your pardon. And now Georgia calls a timeout. Well, John Vaughn had one of the most disturbing evenings of his career down at LSU the last time we saw this Auburn football team. A tough night in Baton Rouge, Ron, as you mentioned, we were there, and that wind was really swirling in that stadium, but how this young man has responded since that time has been really impressive. Let's go down the sideline. Holly Rose got more on that story. Well, guys, Coach Tommy Tuberville of Auburn told us he was really impressed. Sunday morning after that devastating five-missed field goal performance, he looked out his window, and out on the practice field was kicker John Vaughn. He had piled up ten balls at each spot that he had missed from in that game. He said he was out there for a couple of hours. He would pick up all those balls and then move to the next spot where he had missed from. So he really took it to heart and tried to improve after that devastating game. Holly, thank you very much. This is going to be 51 yards. Excellent pooch punt right yep. there. The ball rolls into the end zone, but Ron John Vaughn had not made a field goal over 40 yards all year. And the only time he had tried one over 50, he had missed that one. Yep. So Coach Trepaville uh, rolling the dice a little bit there, trying to catch him off guard and pooch the ball out of bounds deep in her own territory. And you see the reaction by the head coach. Close, but no cigar there. Tommy's a pretty good golfer. He wanted one of those wedge shots to spin <laughs> yeah. back, not one of those three irons that just roll forward when they hit the ground. That's right. High. The only thing, when you, hit a, when you kick a ball like that, you are going to get overspin on it most of the times, aren't you? Here comes Blitz. Thomas Brown 
out over the 30. That's going to be a gain of very close to 14 yards in the play. David Irons from his cornerback position making the tackle. And Thomas Brown is a fan favorite right here. You see Russ Tanner, the center, pull around and make an excellent block. But this guy's a fan favorite, Ron, because he is a great effort football player. About 5'7", 190, and strong. His father is a minister. He's a sophomore out of Tucker, Georgia. Shockley this time straight back in the pocket. Drills the ball too high. Had the receiver there. And Massaquai could not come down with it. Impressive start, although that throw was high right there by D.J. Shockley. And, Ron, we go around and talk to players and coaches every week. How about the respect this entire Athens community and Georgia football team has for this young man, D.J. Shockley? Shockley rolls the pocket to the left this time, throws the ball incomplete. Sean Bailey had his hands on it but couldn't hold on. And we're going to look at some of the plays D.J. Shockley has made, Ron. But keep in mind, this guy sat really for four years behind David Green. The starter last year, David Green, with 52 starts. Most guys in the country would have transferred, bailed out of Georgia. This guy stayed. And because of that, this is probably the closest Georgia football team they've had. He's a big part of it. Third down. They need to take this one off to the 43-and-a-half yard line to keep the drive going. Georgia 10, Auburn 7. Here comes the blitz from everybody, and that ball is tipped. Whoa. Very dangerous as Irons got a hand on it, but no other Auburn defender could get in the vicinity to make the interception off the tip drill. And David Irons, yeah, that's Kenny Irons' brother, man-to-man -man coverage right now. You look at Shockley step up and throw that football. Kevin Hobbs is a man who was hanging on him, applying to pressure. Eddie Kelso stands back to punt. Tereshinsky making sure everybody is straight on this one. Here's the boot. Driving spiral. Trey Smith, they kick it away from him. This is going to be a big gainer for the Georgia Bulldogs as there will be no return. Very long on the kick. 42 yards and away from him. Henderson down there to touch it dead. We'll be right back. You got to get up to get down. You got to get up to get down. Yeah, you got to get up to get down. So get up, get up. Get down. Let's get it on. You got to get up, and that's exactly what they've been doing here. <laughs> getting up and getting down between the hedges in Athens, Georgia. Fast-paced first half by both offenses. Defenses are settling things down just a little bit until this play, because here goes Irons, breaking it at the 50. Check it, it's Brad Lester, his counterpart, who shows that he can break it away, and that's good for 30 yards. Brad Lester out of Lilburn. And is that offensive line good? He is going to go untouched right there. Excellent block right here by Ben Grubbs. And wow, Ron, that is a crater right there that he runs through. <laughs> So Irons and Lester, what a dynamic duo this could turn into very quickly. Hit behind the line of scrimmage, breaks away. Going to have three yards in the play. And these two young men at this rate right now, they're going to have people in Auburn, Georgia, saying Ronnie who and Cadillac who in a short period of time. And the coaches say Brad Lester is the most explosive back. Started against Arkansas, pulled his groin. Don't get hurt, Brad Lester, because well, look at the average. Kenny Irons will be in the game. Almost seven yards a carry. Sets in the pocket, going to go long, and it is caught by Mix. Anthony Mix. Paul Oliver on the defensive play, and they've spotted it down at the yard-and-a-half yard line. And Anthony Mix 
the wide receiver in a tight end's body right here is going to come out of the bunch formation and run a wheel route on Paul Oliver. This guy is 6'5", 240. Really good coverage, but just a perfectly thrown football by Brandon Cox. Ron, that is good as you can throw that football. So the ball was fumbled. I saw the beanbag go down, and they have spotted it at the six-yard line rather than at the yard-and-a-half line. Kenny Irons comes into the ball game for the Auburn Tigers. Pitch back goes to Irons. Turns the corner. Touchdown, Auburn. Slaughter the fullback with a paving block. And Leon Hart, number 72, the backup offensive guard run in the football game. An impressive display of power and also throwing on that play prior to that by the quarterback, Brandon Cox. John Vaughn with the extra point attempt. Kick is up and it is good. So let's take a timeout. 618 left until halftime, and Auburn has retaken the lead by four. So Auburn has jumped back on top. 14 to 10. We have 618 left to play until halftime. Well, how about these running backs for Auburn? Four plays, 75 yards, 100 are one minute and 35 seconds. Lester, two rushes for 34. Going to be taken at the six by Browning. Tyson Browning cuts it back to the middle, tackled it to 28. We go back and look at the touchdown. Watch big Troy Riddick. The offensive tackle right here is going to get an excellent block out here. And Kenny Irons, again, on just the toss sweep. There's big Riddick out in front at 330 pounds. The thing you love about Kenny Irons, Ron, he runs north and south now. Not a whole lot of wasted steps. So Danny Weir is in the ball game at tailback, number 28. Nice job of turning his body, and there's Big Pope. The tight end going to ramble for about 22 yards on the play. <laughs> Jonathan Wilhite will make the tackle. And he is fun to watch. He blocks at the line of scrimmage, releases in the flat. Six foot seven, 260 pounds, and a good idea right there by Wilhite to go down and try to chop him right here rather than to take him high. <laughs> that's, that's the smartest play made tonight, probably. Ware gets the pitch back. He'll take it back into the boundary, and he'll be tackled after a gain of about three yards. And, Ron, both of these teams lost so many players from last year in the draft. Last year, some high, high-profile players on both teams. Not a lot of superstars yet on either team but a lot of ability as we look at, I believe that is Danny Ware down at the end of that play. So Ron Franklin, Bob Davey, and Holly Rowe coming to you from a jam-packed house in uh, Athens, Georgia. The 109th meeting between Auburn and the Georgia Bulldogs. It's the oldest rivalry in the Deep South, and they have played tonight <laughs> just like it is not only one of the oldest or the oldest but uh, one of the hottest and to, to back up a point as we continue to look at Danny Ware being treated by the training staff one of the points that Bob made earlier in the ball game in talking with both of these coaching staffs how much respect they have for each other this is really a healthy healthy rivalry if you know exactly what I mean I mean well, they, they really like each other I know where you're headed because I'm going to put on the end of it Auburn next week has what you call a nasty <laughs> rivalry with Alabama but really as we look at Tommy Tuberville so much respect for these two programs and so many similarities Ron since the year 2000 both these schools Auburn and Georgia 34 and 12 overall. That's one and two in the Southeastern Conference. That really is a credit to these coaches and these programs to have these football teams this year in this position. 
because as we know they lost so many draft choices off both of these football teams last year good look at Mark Richt on the sideline and uh, I'm sure he is anxious to talk to both Danny Ware and also to the trainers this time of year everybody comes up with a lot of nicks but uh, George and Auburn both seem to have a little bit more than their share of just nicks second down and long as time is back in he sees man-to-man -man coverage right here by Auburn Brown and Thomas fighting hard is going to have a gain of about seven yards. Reese Davis, let's check back with you at the studio. All right, Ryan, checking in now on Boston College in North Carolina State. Matt Ryan, who stepped in as starting quarterback now for BC, firing a dart in there to Chris Miller in Boston College at home with a 17-10 lead at the half. Colorado trying to lock up a spot in the Big 12 title game, coming back, but still down three to Iowa State. Cyclones trying to win at home. Tight one going there. Short drop. Quick look in. Got it complete. That's enough for the first down. Massify on the receiving end of that one. You see big Leonard Pope helping him up. Will hide on the cover. One thing we've not seen tonight, Ron, is the quarterback runs, the predetermined quarterback runs. It's such a big part of this Georgia offense. You know Mark Rick wants to save those because of the situation his quarterback's in with that knee injury. But impressive display right now by D.J. Shockley. Could see Dickens for Auburn and Shockley for Georgia. in on the discussion and we don't sometimes what happens in those situations Ron the defense sometimes calls out a cadence or a move call they may be warning the defense about that quick count handoff hit behind the line of scrimmage Thomas Brown is decked by Marquise Gunn Marquise Gunn, a guy with no preseason hype at all. Everyone talked about Quentin Groves and Stanley McClover, but he's been Auburn's most consistent defensive lineman all year. This time from the shotgun, second down and long. Shockley zips the pass to Pope, the tight end. Was falling as he caught it, and Williams was there to make the tackle on him. Got to be short of the first down. It'll be third. And they're taking advantage of the big tight end. That time had him matched up on the linebacker, Antarius Williams. Just a little option route by Leonard Pope. Third down. They need to take it to the 28. Or actually closer to the 27. Shockley, here comes pressure. Steps up, gonna run. Headed for the sideline, and I believe he got it. Yes, he did. Right on the mark. Kevin Hobbs was there to force him out of bounds. And that applause that you heard was from the faithful saying, hey, he looks like he's 100%. And I think a collective sigh of relief because no evidence of a limp at all. He tucks the football, and when you get D.J. Shockley able to do this, then you know Georgia has the total package on offense, Ron, because his legs and quarterback runs are such a big part of the balance of this offense. Has to give him added confidence. Clock is stopped, 3.06 left until halftime this is the eighth play of the Georgia drive Thomas Brown bounces it outside at the 20 and again a very close to 10 yards on this one at Terrius Williams with another stop defensively but not before he picked up big yardage and watch the block of big Max Gene Gillis right here Rocking around, that's an athletic move as he gets the linebacker, number 21, Karibi Didi, on the ground. Excellent offensive line play in this game tonight, Ron, on both sides of the ball. i got to say that run was about nine and a half yards, so he's got just uh, a few inches to pick up the first down. Georgia trading by four, 14 to 10, three minutes until halftime. 
and Georgia now with two tight ends. They take it to the right side. That's Sutherland to fullback, and he'll have the first down. Reese Davis, let's uh, check back with you. All right, Ryan, coming up on the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report, Lou and Mark are here. Alabama's perfect season is over. The game day guys in Tuscaloosa to talk about it. We'll also discuss Steve Spurrier's victory over Florida. Steve Spurrier can take his and beat yours, or he can take yours and beat his. We'll explain why. <laughs> Big victory for South Carolina game, but at halftime, I'm going to tell you about the bigger picture for the Gamecocks down the road. All right, we'll see you at halftime, Ryan. Okay, thanks very much, guys. They go with the running play. Boy, that's a nice tackle by Travis Williams. If he doesn't grab him by the ankle, Thomas Brown might have had a lot more running room. You talk about a guy, Ron, that loves football. It's Travis Williams. David Gibbs, the first-year defensive coordinator at Auburn, came from the Denver Broncos. He said this guy is a will linebacker in the NFL, loves to study football, and a great tackler. 11th play, it started back at the 29-yard line. Second down and 11. Little play action. Shockley under heavy pressure, steps up into the pocket, gets away, and he's all the way down to the 10-yard line. T.J. Jackson finally made the stop after Shockley ran by about six defenders. Are we officially done talking about the knee and the <laughs> knee brace now? As you look at that athleticism right there. I'll tell you what, David Green must have been a heck of a player to start 52 straight games ahead of D.J. Shockley here in Georgia. Well, for starters, he was. But plus, if I, D.J. was unfortunate, had a couple of injuries that sidelined him as well. Sets in the pocket, drills this one. Incomplete. Masakai could not hold on at the one-yard line. Montavious Fitz was covering, but if he can hold on, that's a touch. And Muhammad Masakwe right here on a little inside route. Wow. Hard to see right there. Looks like maybe Montavious Fitz run did get a hand on that football. Great pressure right there by Travis Williams, the linebacker. Show the field goal attempt about to come. Katu. Let's take a look at our All-State kick chart. From this distance right here, he's perfect. Eight of eight in his career. Ball is down and obviously plenty of distance, and he is perfect. Now nine of nine. And we have a one-point ball game at the 113 mark. Holly Rowe, let's check with you. Well, guys, we're talking about DJ Shockley and his knee, but people don't realize just what this young man went through to get back for this game. He has only got one class, which is three credit hours, so he had all day, almost every day, to rehab this knee. I said, what did you do specifically? He said, it's more like, what didn't I do? He did ultrasound. He used laser therapy. He got in the pool so he could move laterally. He tried heat. He tried cold and then repeated. So DJ Shackley doing everything in his power. I said, why was it so important to you? He said, this team is important to me and they needed me. He also rode a horse too. We're gonna show that in yeah, a second half. Mark Rick took them yeah. out. The final bit of that uh, recovery process, rehab process was to put him on a horse. But you know what, well, what thing happened though? They had been going, at this time of year, things get boring. You, you, so they find something different to do. They'd been going to the aquatic center, but they go to the equestrian center. And everybody was shocked. And here's DJ show you how much he has. He walked behind the horse. DJ, don't do that, partner. But here he is riding, injured knee and all. Now, probably the, the scariest thing is this fellow right here. That's the biggest man ever to be at that equestrian center. Jerry go out on that Anderson, and say that right now. Who weighs 315 pounds, and we're still trying to get word on who was more shaken, the horse or Gerald. But I'll tell you who else rode was the big right tackle, Dennis Rowland, who's 6'9". Well, the horse is in rehab now, <laughs> following that same rehab process DJ Shockley did. Here comes the kick. 
Trey Smith going to take this one in the end zone, and they will go from the 20-yard line. Monday Night Countdown brings you all of the latest news and notes from around the NFL leading up to kickoff of Monday Night Football. Monday Night's Countdown delivered by UPS, 7.30 Eastern. Then be sure and join Al Michaels and John Madden in Philly for a vital NFC East matchup with the struggling Eagles need a win against the visiting Cowboys. Monday Night Football, 9 Eastern on ABC. We don't have to talk about Carol Owens, do we? Not me. <laughs> Please, that's not. How much conversation? You say it. it that was not, not in the not playing. Here's a draw play. Going to go for short yardage. As Blue is there to make the tackle on Kenny Irons. And Georgia with two timeouts left in the half. Probably see what happened here on second down, Ron, and may use that timeout right here after this play. Harvard really taking their time here. And you're exactly right. Mark Rick continues to look up at the clock. Brandon Cox. His ball club on top by one. 14 to 13 with a half minute left until halftime. Pitch back goes to Irons. Turns the corner. Has five. Still running. Has ten. And counted off at about 11 yards in the play. And they will move the sticks. It's first down Tigers. Trey Battle finally stopped him. I think Georgia will forget about that timeout right now, but you see why this Auburn offense, since the second half of the Arkansas game, has just come on and been dominant, Ron, running the football. Clock is down to 11, now 10. Both clubs headed for the locker room. So our halftime scorer, Auburn 14 and Georgia 13. Now let's join Chris Fowler in Tuscaloosa for the Pontiac Performance Halftime. You gotta get up to get down. You gotta get up to get down. Yeah, you gotta get up to get down. So get up, get up. Get down. Let's get it on. So welcome back as we take a look at the stats in the first half of play with a 14 to 13 score. What jumps out at you, 155 yards rushing for the Auburn Tigers. And one thing you don't see on there, which correlates to the rushing yards of Auburn, time of possession. Auburn held that ball for 18 minutes in the first half compared to 11 for Georgia. And since the Arkansas game, really since the Georgia Tech game, the first game of the year, Ron, this Auburn offense has found an identity run the football Kenny Irons with 125 yards in the first half take the pressure off the quarterback Brandon Cox and the Georgia defense their defensive line front seven better bow up because right now Auburn's running that football on them. so Uncle says let's uh, let's get it on I'll tell you what we were here in early September when it was hot. I never saw a golf off the ground off that bag of ice the whole night. <laughs> so obviously it's a comfortable night down there on the field. Here's Clark with the kickoff. Obviously not returnable. Holly Rowe, let's check with you. Well, guys, catching up with both coaches at halftime, Mark Rick said he's very concerned about their run fits. He said, we really have no excuses. We just had some bad guys, two guys in one gap on that running game in the first half, and Auburn really gashed us. He said they've got to get that straightened out for the second. Now for Auburn, Tommy Tuberville has said they've got to do a better job on their offensive line getting a push. He said, we're getting pushed around up there, not creating enough of a pocket for Brandon Cox. So look for them to control that a little better here in the second half. Okay, Holly. Boy, some impressive numbers on Tuberville when leading the last two seasons at halftime. And if that running total goes up, you start getting around 200 yards on the ground that you're very hard to beat. I don't care who you are. Here comes a blitz. Shockley gets away from one, gets away from two, and he's off. Finally stopped. That's a gain of 25 yards by Shockley. David Irons finally made the tackle. You're going to see Auburn right now in double eagle old bear defense. And right here, they're playing man-to-man -man coverage. And anytime you're playing man-to-man -man coverage, Ron, and the quarterback can break the line of scrimmage, you look right here, 
There is nobody on that side of the football field. So Shockley with an extremely impressive start to open the second half. You see his numbers passing. One touchdown, no interceptions. And the rushing in the first half, three for 34. Wants to throw. Going to go deep. Left side. Pretty good coverage right there. The locals wanted pass interference, but that's not going to be called. It was Will Hyde who was down there step for step with Muhammad Massaquai. Boy, excellent coverage by Jonathan Will Hyde, who has started the last several football games for Auburn, beating out Montavis Pitts. They go up the top to Muhammad Massaqua. That is great coverage. Muhammad Massaqua from Charlotte, North Carolina, same high school as the Leak brothers. Coming out of a good passing offense in high school. Brian McClendon, number 16, checks into the lineup. He'll go with a running play, but Thomas Brown, though, he's high-stepping and going to fight his way for the first down. As you can see, him twisting and turning, and he takes it down to the 42-yard line. Excellent play by the fullback right here. Right here, watch him as the lead blocker. He's going to come around and chop Brandon Sutherland, the fullback right here, Ron. Right there gets the linebacker, Karibi Didi, on the ground. Tony Milton will come in the ball game at fullback, number nine. Shockley, play action. There he is, first down, not quite. Massaqua, they go to him right over the middle. David Irons on the cover. I don't think he could be covered much better. David Irons up there in bump and run coverage, but excellent throw by DJ Shockley. See the multiple substitutions coming in. Chester Adams and Michael Turner on the offensive line. The extra tight end checks in. And Ron, this Georgia offense so much more dependent on the play of the quarterback than the Auburn offense. A lot of it on D.J. Shockley. Second down and short. Down to play with, but they're going to not go there. In fact, the running play, though, was Sutherland. They're not going to pick up the first down. It's going to be third down and maybe just a little bit longer. Gunn and Wayne Dickens combining on the stop. We look at Mark Rick. Ron, back to my point of being dependent on the quarterback play. That's why it was such a devastating loss for D.J. Shockley not to play the second half against Arkansas in the big game against Florida because so much of this offense on the quarterback. Third down and short, but this is two down territory right here, or four down territory, I think. Play clock, still plenty of time as they come to the line of scrimmage. It's still at 10. Auburn gangs up at the line of scrimmage. Milner goes in motion. They hand it off to the fullback, Sutherland, and he'll have the first down, plus about three or four more. And Terrius Williams making the stop. Georgia offensive coaches say Brandon Sutherland, the perfect fullback, runs a 4-5-5 five, five at 240 pounds. Looks like a fullback's supposed to look, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. <laughs> and you know, plus, he catches the ball well. They, they like his abilities in a lot of different ways. Capacity crowd here tonight, Athens, Georgia. Oldest rivalry in the Deep South, the 109th meeting between Georgia and Auburn. And it's a one-point game. Short drop by Shockley, threw it low. Was it trapped or did he catch it? The official is going to give it to him. Massaqua on the receiving end. Now, every play is under review in this conference. And they're taking a look at it. I know that Rogers Redding is the, the guy who is head of that crew tonight. You get Will Hyde bailing out of there a little bit. That ball looked like it skipped to me. I'd like to see it one more time. But as you mentioned, Ron, Previously it is under Ryan review. It's under further review. I yep. think yeah, it bounced. I think Muhammad's going to lose a reception right there. <laughs> You know, they're explaining that uh, not all plays are reviewable, but like I said, 
uh, talking with Rodgers before the ball game and also at halftime, I want to double check on the, the bean bag and uh, the ball that was put back at the five and a half yard line for Auburn just before they scored. Uh, and he was explaining that's where the ball was coming out, which obviously if it goes forward, they bring it back. But in this case right here, they, they are reviewing every play, and if it's one that they think needs to go under even, even a tighter scrutiny, meaning that the referee comes over and visits with them. And I'm with Bob. I think they're going to take this one away. Once again, it has to be indisputable evidence. They ruled it a catch, so they need that evidence to overturn. But I think you can see the ball skip. You know, you really do, Ron, have to give credit to Dave Perry in the Big Ten Conference for really going out kind of as guinea pigs and starting the replay system now that's been really embraced by everyone in college football. But I remember a year ago how controversial in some ways it was, how nervous everyone was about how that would go, but it was a huge success. Taking a lot of time right now for a about a six yard gain. But as you mentioned, every play critical in a game like this and the magnitude of this game. And, you know, we'll try to show you here in the third quarter before we get too far away from it on the last drive that Auburn scored on to go in front. After review, the pass hit the ground. Therefore, it is incomplete. It will be second down and 10 from the 29 yard line. Point I was going to make was on that play back in the first half just before Auburn uh, scored the touchdown. The ball is fumbled. Here's a key play. Watch how close. You talk about a game of inches. The catch is made. Watch the fumble. All right, it's coming out right there, but here's the important point. Look at the ball bound. If that had hit that pylon from the field of play, Auburn would not have had a touchdown. That would have been a touchback, and Georgia would have had the football. That's how close these games can be. And this one looks as though it's going to be that close. A one-point ball game, 14 to 13. Shockley. Shockley. Shockley with a first and goal. 21 yards. He may be the only guy I've seen who's faster with the knee brace on than with the knee brace off. Missed tackle right there by number 31, Antarius Williams. Needs to protect that football and hold a little bit tighter. But how important is DJ Shockley to this offense and this Georgia football team, Ron? Gandy did a good job of breaking down, making the tackle. It's going to be the ninth play of the drive as the Bulldogs set up shop for the first and goal just inside the 10. They trail by one. Short drop, fade route, touchdown, Massaqua. And you see why the Muhammad Masakwa has become the guy for Georgia at receiver run. He's only dropped one pass all year. Excellent throw, though, by D.J. Shockley, putting that football where only Muhammad Masakwa could make the play and not David Irons, the quarterback. How about that drive? Boy, I'm telling you, you talk about impressive. Extra point attempt. Katu knocks it home. 100yardblitz.com for your chance to win. What a tremendous atmosphere. This is the first Auburn Georgia game I've had the opportunity to do, and this is a great, great atmosphere here tonight in a well played football game. The drive nine plays, 80 yards, four minutes and 15 seconds. Shockley, two carries, 46 yards. Aroma Shadu is the man you were just looking at. He's not going to have a chance to return this one. It's five yards deep. Now our Dr. Pepper SEC update. Georgia, and in case you missed what happened earlier today, the old ball coach, now at South Carolina, knocked off his former team and his alma mater in uh, Florida, which means Georgia can clinch tonight a December 3rd trip to Atlanta and the SEC championship. Alabama was beaten, knocked off by LSU, so Auburn does not control their own destiny right now because you remember, you saw it on ESPN, Auburn lost in overtime, head-to-head -head competition with LSU. So any tie with LSU is not good for the Auburn Tigers. Here comes Irons. 
breaks one tackle going to take it across the 25 to the 26 Jarvis Jackson there defensively you talk about South Carolina beating Florida I think Steve Spurrier would like to have Kenny Irons in that backfield keep in mind Kenny Irons transferred from South Carolina the run how does Georgia stop the run here in the second half no doubt you better look for Greg Blue the big safety coming down in that box because Auburn is controlling the running game 131 yards on 20 rushes an average of 6.6 .6 per try and two touchdowns crowd coming to life on second down and four here's irons nothing left still nothing to the right so he put his head down he's gonna have the first down for Dunn Wheeler on the stop along with Greg Blue. And how about the run Kenny Irons' has had? 184 yards against Arkansas, 218 against LSU, 102 against Ole Miss, and 107 in the first half last week against Kentucky. I love how hard this guy runs, and I go back to being hungry, staying ahead of that pack of Brad Lester, the other tailback. Obamano in motion to the top of your screen. They fake the counter. Pass is thrown complete to the fullback slaughter. And Reese Davis, let's check back with you. What do you got for us? Ron, Tiger Bell Studio Update, Arizona State and UCLA. You know the Bruins just 6 and 17 after Halloween the last five years, but bouncing back nicely from that loss to Arizona, Drew Olson finding Brandon Brazil. 42-28, still a lot of time to go after all it is the Pac-10. How in the world Washington beats Arizona after Arizona club UCLA last week? Who knows? Well, wow. that, that is a <laughs> quite a whodunit. Second down and three. Irons hit behind the line of scrimmage. That's Tony Taylor. Tony's had an outstanding game tonight. And Tony Taylor run missed two games with an elbow injury. Last year, he missed all year with an ACL injury. And watch him close the gap right here. And an excellent tackle. Keep in mind, in college football, they don't have that rule like they do in the NFL. In the NFL, that would have been a penalty grabbing him by the back of the collar right there. Nine tackles, five solo. That's a season high for him. And his coaches said this week, he's got to step up, how to have a big game. And so far, he has done just that. Short drop, nothing to the right, throws back to the left, pass incomplete. That's Anthony Mix who couldn't hold on. Paul Oliver was covering. Holly Rowe will uh, check with you on the sideline. Well, guys, they have taken a blow on the defensive line for Georgia. Kedrick Golston will not be able to continue. Now, the coaches call him the quarterback of their defense. He had an ankle injury to the left ankle. He taped it up, got in a three-point stand, and tried to go in the first half, but no go. He is out for the rest of the game. They'll sorely miss him up front, although that time, forcing a three and out, they look pretty good. Okay, Holly, down on the sideline, he was talking with a teammate as, uh, as you were giving us the story, and... and I don't know if he's going to try to come back in or not. Line drive kick right here. Flowers is going to be stopped just short of the 30. Ball is loose. Beanbag is down. Auburn says they have it. And the officials let Yes, sir. Auburn Tiger football. Dee, Dee recovers the football. And first of all, a line drive punt. You see the ball clearly out right there as Flowers coughs it up. And Karibi Didi, the linebacker, Ron. The ball looks like it's stripped out of there. Hard to see what number that was, but clearly a fumble and great field position right now for Auburn after Georgia forced the three and out. So Georgia leads at the eight and a half minute mark, 20 to 14. But a big break for the Auburn Tigers. Let's see if they can take advantage of it. Now from the Georgia 30-yard line. Obamano. 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Auburn. Cooper Wallace, the tight end, through the paving block. 30 yards. How big... 
are turnovers in college football or any level of football. And how about the play call by Al Borges of taking advantage, Ron, of the great field position. And no one feels worse than that young man right there, Thomas Flowers. Wow. John Vaughn to attempt the extra point. Trying to make it. Auburn back on top by one. And he does. Slides it through on the left side. Let's go to break. Following the fumble. The 30-yard touchdown. Obamanu on the run. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper. One taste and you get it. Oh, the man is in the house. <laughs> Oh boy, what a ball game, 21-20, Auburn on top. After they kick this off, we're gonna go back and look at that play. As you look at the takeaways in the ball game, each with a turnover, each turns into a touchdown. And Georgia forces the three and out, and then the big turnover by Thomas Flowers on the punt return. Great call by Al Borges, Auburn's offensive coordinator on the reverse. Tyson Browning. One of the deep men, this is Clark kicking off. High spinner. Going to go three yards deep. He's going to bring it out. Here's Browning. 15. He'll take it out to the 25. How about the score, Bob? Well, I'm going to show you three things on this. First, the block right here by Cooper Wallace. The tight end comes around on the reverse. The second thing, the reverse by Ben Obamano. And then the third thing, keep your eye on the defensive end right here, Will Thompson, who gets sucked in by the play fake to Irons. Cooper Wallace comes around, there's no one there. He finally chops Greg Blue or gets in the way of Greg Blue. But the turnover, a loud field position. So Wallace, it might as well have been a, a pancake because he, he took him off stride, took him out of the play just enough. Danny Weir. Back in the ball game at tailback. That's good news for the Georgia faithful. And now we got movement and flags. Start 81 on the offense. Penalty be five yards. Down remains first. Big Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> if he moves, the world sees <laughs> yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> Junior out of Americas. Spent a year at Hargraves Military Academy. Told us they had a tough time finding them that military uniform to fit up there at Hargraves. <laughs> yeah, he might, might have looked as though he was wearing flood pants for a goodly part of his uh, stay there. Shockley, middle screen, throws it complete, ball is loose. Who got it? No, they're going to say incomplete pass, stop scrambling. Didi is the man who was there again getting on the football. Masokai is the man who couldn't hold on. And Auburn plays these undersized linebackers. Didi's about 200 pounds and just closes on that screen. Wow, that was close to possession right there. Let's take another look at it. Keep it in mind, this is in slow motion, obviously. That is very close to being possession in a fumble run. As soon as this snap happens, it won't matter. He, it did ride a little high when he tried to, to get it set. Second down. Shockley deep over the middle. Got it. Complete. First down, Georgia. And that's Brian McClendon, the senior out of Atlanta Mays High School, 22 yards. And Brian McClendon wide open, Ron. And you have to wonder why Brian McClendon didn't stay up after he catches this ball because there was some yards after the catch. But keep in mind, Georgia has dropped some balls at the wide receiver position. And I think he just really wanted to look that football in. Hey, listen, he never broke stride. That was a perfectly thrown football. And had a chance to gain some yards after the catch. Here's Danny Ware. Breaks it outside. Good ankle high tackle by David Irons. Good to see Danny Ware back in the football game after that injury in the yep. first half. 71 yards against Florida. Really has become kind of their leading tailback here of late. Not much Thomas Brown in this game, Ron. You know, interesting. Danny Ware out of Rock Mart, Georgia, was not highly recruited. Told us he came down to Maryland and Georgia, he did, didn't he? Yep. Well, look at Auburn crowding the line of scrimmage. Here comes the pressure, and Shockley is going to be sacked. McClover, don't have to look for his number, just look for the hair. 
and I think it grows a little more with every sack. First time that they have gotten to him tonight officially with a sack. And Stanley McClover is back right here. We watch at the top. He is a 4-5-5-40 guy, Ron. He's matched up on the big offensive tackle right there, Daniel Inman. Back off that hamstring injury. Played well last week against Kentucky. Rode him hard to the outside and then took the inside route. And uh, he just beat him clearly. So now third down and 14. Winds up. Ball should have been intercepted. And it was dropped by David Irons. Ron Franklin, Bob Davey, and Holly Rowe coming to you from between the hedges in Athens, Georgia for the South's oldest rivalry, 109th meeting between the Georgia Bulldogs and the Auburn Tigers. Auburn has won nine of the last 11 trips here to Sanford Stadium. And tonight they're on top by one and showing that just because they're on the road, they played Georgia extremely tough here in Athens. Ely Kelso, you see his numbers very good tonight. His longest, 46. His average, 44. Trey Smith, Auburn's punt returner. Ron has had some trouble in recent weeks catching the football on these punts. Good high, wobbly spiral. Calls for the fair catch and makes it. What a Miller highlight moment in time takes us back to the epic 1996 matchup. There's no way we can do it with one second. And Bobo throws that thing in the end zone and yes! touchdown in the goal line. Damon Craig takes a snap and he's coming wide outside. And we come up and we hit him side on the 16-yard line. And we've stopped him. And we have won this thing in overtime. It was the first SEC game. Ever to go into overtime, 56-49. Georgia defeating Auburn. And you see Jim Donnan yeah. being carried off that field. Here's the running play with Irons. Going to be short. And Larry Munson, the guy who made that call, still sitting in the booth. And he is, <laughs> he loves these Bulldogs. And, of course, one of the great calls that you'll ever hear from him, the long touchdown against the Florida Gators. Which Georgia came from behind to win. And he kept hollering at the top of his lungs, run, Lindsey, run. <laughs> Lindsey Scott taking it the distance. Here comes pressure. Screen pass. Boy, they must have been in the huddle. Demario Mentor making the tackle on Kenny Irons. I'm telling you, as soon as he caught the little swing pass, they were all over it. Big third down. Auburn's tendency has been screens. Not putting a lot on the quarterback in these down and distances, Ron. Third down. They've got to take it out to the 38-yard line. I mean, this crowd is standing and cheering. Trying to get the defense pumped up. From the shotgun. Stepping up. Pressure from behind. He's going to be sacked. And that is Quentin Moses. Yeah. I think there was a false start run on Auburn before that ball was ever snapped. Prior to the snap, timeout, Auburn. <laughs> That's the second time tonight. Keep in mind, you can call timeouts from That's the right. bench. From the bench, does you certainly not have can. to be a player on the field. So let's take a timeout. Five minutes exactly. Left third quarter. One point lead, Auburn. You're back, and for the second time tonight, Auburn has saved themselves for the third down and long by calling a timeout. And the sack of the quarterback, it's so noisy in here, none of the players heard the whistle. But it was a legit timeout called at the Auburn bench. Remember, they got to take it out to the 38-yard line to keep the drive going. Brandon Cox hands it off, running play. Irons going to be wrestled down hard at the 35 by Trey Battle. How hard does Kenny Irons run that football? I mean, he rips that thing up in there. And Trey Battle again run the undersized safety at 165 pounds. 
That's a lick right there. He is impressive running that football with great effort. 24 carries for him, 147 yards and two touchdowns. Third punt of the night. And now a timeout called by Georgia. And the reason they did, I'll explain it after the Aflac trivia question. Here's tonight's Aflac trivia question. With Auburn and Georgia meeting for the 109th time, what is the most played rivalry in Division 1A football? There's a hint. Page 1020 of the College Football Encyclopedia. That answer later on. Two things. That's a lot of pages. Yeah. Second thing, you did a little bit of the Affleck voice inflection right there when yeah, you read I, well, it. That's the first time I've I, heard it. I didn't mean to. Well, that was pretty good. <laughs> hey, you know, what we should say is the reason that timeout was called with great haste this time on the Georgia bench is because they were about to get caught with 12 men on the field. That would have given Auburn a first down. Don't bring that up right now in Gainesville, Florida, because the Ooh. same situation Ooh. today in that football game. Obviously, yeah. Florida, a chance to get that football back down by eight points with about two minutes left in the game. Florida called for 12 men on the field, 15-yard penalty, first down. So you have to say a good timeout right there hey, by Georgia. 30 seconds ago, Mark Rick was saying, I really don't like that rule. Right now, he loves that rule because it would have given Auburn a huge first down. Here's Cody Bliss to punt it away. You see him on the run, still on the run, and there's the kick. Line drive, fielded at the 16 by Thomas Flowers. Thomas is going to make sure he holds on to this one for dear life. Cooper Wallace makes the tackle. Reese Davis, what do you got for us? Ron Colorado trying to win its way into the Big 12 championship game on the move against Iowa State deep in Cyclone territory and Joel Klatt throws it right to Tim Dobbins. Tim might have gotten away with a little shove against the Colorado receiver. Turnover, Iowa State with a three-point lead late in the third. All righty, just over six minutes left to play in that one. Our situation, 4-0-1 to play third quarter and it is a one-point Auburn lead. Very good defensive stand by Georgia a moment ago. Thomas Brown tries the right side. Nothing there. This Auburn defense runs you down quickly when you go east and west, don't they? Yeah, and a lot of speed. Obviously, speed over size at Auburn. And, you know, interesting, both these defensive teams, new defensive coordinators, David Gibbs taking over for Gene Chizik, who went to Texas for Auburn. Willie Martinez taking over at Georgia for Brian Van Gorder, who had left but there you take a look at David Gibbs, excellent football coach, one of the most intense guys yeah. you'll ever be around. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a not an understatement. Shockley tried to step up into the pocket, lost his footing. That's going to be a loss of five in the play, and it was Didi who was applying the pressure. Again, they jump in the double eagle or old Buddy Ryan bear defense. They have man-to-man -man coverage. DJ slips, stepping up in that pocket right there. Auburn's not played a lot of bear defense throughout the season, but they're giving them a little dose of it right now. Both sides of the football trying to give the other team definite looks that they have not seen a lot of this year, right? Exactly. Third down and 16. Got to take it all the way to the 30-yard line. Shockley steps up. Still looking. Drills it. Got it complete. Massaquad first down. And you can add about six yards more onto it. Good for 22 yards. Boy, good protection. And you see why they love Muhammad Massaqua. The redshirt freshman wide receiver. Excellent protection, but Auburn only rushes three. Actually rushed three and was spying the nose guard right there for DJ Shockley run and had no pressure run. Brought the safety on that play and this running play straight ahead by Thomas Brown. Will only go for short yardage. Uh, Holly Rowe, let's talk to you. 
Well, guys, Muhammad Massaquah is a true freshman, and he is really starting to make an impact for the Bulldogs this season. He comes from a great high school program, Independence High School in Charlotte, North Carolina, where Chris Leak also was a famous player. But, guys, the most impressive thing about Muhammad, he went from eighth grade without ever losing a game until the Florida game this year. He's a winner. Wow. Short drop, pressure, hit as the ball is thrown. And there you see an incomplete pass. Stanley McClover is the man who made the contact. You see McClover again. Excellent speed getting held a little bit by Daniel Inman. That's a tough matchup right there for big six foot seven, 330 pound Daniel Inman. The speed of McClover again off that hamstring injury back. Danny Weir comes back into the ball game at tailback. It is third down Georgia and they need the 47. I don't think David Gibbs will rush only three on this third down run. Well here you see him crowding and here they come. They picked up the blitz nicely. They got the single coverage and the catch by McClendon. And a flag is down. And that's back at the quarterback. Holding oh. Georgia. Boy, that erases an incredible catch by McClendon. It, it erases a 27 yard gain. Holding 28 red on the offense. Penalty will be 10 yards, previous spot. Now remains third. Boy, Danny Ware, we're going to watch right here. Yeah. Reached out and grabbed. Steve Gandy right there, the safety on the blitz. But it really did run nullify a tremendous effort by yeah. Brian McClendon, the wide receiver. And also the quarterback Shockley just to get that thing away and got it in the right spot toward the sideline. Here they go with Ware on the ground. Crosses the 35 and he's out to the 39. Travis Williams defensively. And you have to wonder where Thomas Brown is. Not getting a whole lot of playing time here in the second half, but what a huge penalty. Negated a huge play by Brian McClendon. So standing by to punt is Gordon Ely Kelso. Fourth time that he would have punted tonight. Trey Smith is the deep man. And again, that's Joe Tarasinski, who was the personal protector. You see him moving back, and he is in a position that when they want to fake a punt, he is there to take that snap and to throw the football. Fair catch is called for and made at the 13-yard line. Well, the answer to tonight's Aflac trivia question, what is the most played rivalry in Division I-A football? And I have to say that when this was, when was talked about in our meeting this morning, Holly came right up with it without looking for the answer. Minnesota against Wisconsin, 115 games. That series started in 18-19. They play, play for, for the Paul Bunyan Axe. Yeah, I get a little leery when I see that thing. Those kids running around the field with that huge axe. Hoping that no one has an axe to grind. First and 10 from the 15. Hit by Tony Taylor, maybe a gain of a half yard, but let's just say no gain. And first down, so critical because Auburn really struggling in third and long. Well, you can see Brandon Cox putting the mouthpiece up in his face mask. That is going to be the final play of the third quarter. And we head to the final 15 in quite a shootout. Auburn at 21, Georgia 20. Polaroid. I'm Ron Franklin along with Bob Davy and Holly Rowe from Athens, Georgia, and the scoring by quarters 10 3 and 7 for the Bulldogs, 7 7 and 7 for the Auburn Tigers. Recognize that young man, David Pollock. Oh, what an outstanding defensive end. Plays for Cincinnati now. 
one of a number of fine young players in the Bengal organization, and they're winning. Play action by Cox. Got it away to Cole Bennett, the tight end, and he's going to take it out to around the 35-yard line. Excellent, excellent play action fake by Brandon Cox, and Cole Bennett is going to come off the play action right here on the crossing route, which causes the linebackers to freeze the play action. Excellent play call. And Brandon Cox, I mentioned, reminds me a little bit of David Green, Georgia's quarterback from last year as we looked at David Pollock on that sidelines. And Pollock and Green, best of friends. First down from the 35, again play action. They roll it to the left. Cox throws this one. Did he catch it in bounds? No. Incomplete pass. Demario Minter was out there trying to tip the ball around. And Jeff Owens, the freshman defensive lineman for Georgia, in the game with Kedrick Golston out, Ron, really caused that right there. Not a great decision, obviously, by Brandon Cox, but this guy right here is going to be a big-time defensive lineman in the Southeastern Conference. You know, the great thing about him, it always happens with the really good athletes. Hey, he's out there having fun now. He's bouncing around, got that smile on his face. The offensive lineman having to block him or not smile, I can tell you that. They set up the screen or tried to, and he's just going to throw this one away wisely. Holly Rowe, let's uh, bring you into the conversation here. Well, guys, it's so sad right now on the sideline. Kedrick Golston wants to be out there so bad, this defensive lineman for Georgia. He keeps trying to push off on the sideline here, show his coaches that he's okay to get back in this game, and then he's loitering around trying to get their attention. They have a big saying here, finish the drill at Georgia, which means you've got to go the distance. So, guys, he just is desperate to try to finish this game, but so far the coaches aren't buying it. I tell you, this crowd right now is on fire in this stadium. This is a great atmosphere. Third down. They need to take it to the 44 and a half yard line. Auburn leads it by one. From the shotgun, Cox steps up, got a man, and it is almost intercepted. Cutting in front was Trey Battle, number 25, and look at him. He knows he passed up a really good opportunity. And I'll tell you what, Trey Battle started out at Georgia as a walk-on run. He has two interceptions on the season. Had a chance right there. I'll tell you what, 25 trade battles had an excellent night. This guy is a chemistry major here at Georgia. That would have been a tough interception. Bliss stands in to uh, kick it away. Here's that kick. Again, line drive on the run, and it's fumbled. Flowers picks it up, and Flowers will not make it back to the 20-yard line. 53 yards in the kick and six on the return. Well, tomorrow night ESPN has the latest chapter in one of the NFL's oldest rivalries, Pittsburgh against the Browns. This one at Heinz Field. Uh, this at 8.30 Eastern, also available in high definition on ESPN HD. Then, of course, coverage begins 7.30 Eastern with NFL Primetime, presented by Miller Lite. I could took it to the house. Might have gotten a little cool. Yeah. Got on the three quarter length sleeves. There's probably should have to go to long sleeve. <laughs> I guess they have that. Shockley with the play action, gonna reverse it. Gets the shoulders turn and throws it complete to McClendon. And then knocked out of bounds and a flag right here on the sideline. Johnson picks up the personal foul and DJ Shockley Ron rolling to his left which is difficult for a right-handed quarterback throws that football back across his body Chris Browder give impression and Brian McClendon on the crossing route has started to emerge right here in the second half obviously a late hit by Merrill Johnson the freshman linebacker right there so so a long play to begin with and then tack on the 15 yards. And instead of having the ball at their 45, Georgia has it now at about the 40-yard line of Auburn. Danny Weir in the ballgame at tailback. 
Auburn again, Ron, jumping in that double eagle bear defense. Eight man front. Lobs it. Big guys there. Did he catch it? Couldn't hold on. Leonard Pope against Antarius Williams. Antarius is 5'11. Pope well documented, 6'7. Now we talk about double eagle or bear defense. You notice the center of the two guards are covered. The other thing, right here, man to man coverage with the linebacker up in a press position on the tight end, Leonard Pope. And that's right, Ron. That's 5'11 against 6'7. That is a great job of just stripping that football out of there by Ontarius Williams. Leonard with a good opportunity to catch it. Couldn't hold on. So it's second down and 10. That quiets the crowd for the moment. Shockley, great protection. Lobs it over the middle. Got it to his running back, Danny Ware. Still on his feet inside the 20 as they try to wrestle the ball away. And the man I'm talking about is Will Harry, but that is good for 21 yards. And that time Auburn in man-to-man -man coverage. We're going to look at the protection first. Excellent job right there by the Auburn offensive line. Ron, they're in man-to-man -man coverage, and they turned the tailback Danny Ware loose. Schnetzer in its center, the senior out of Noonan, Georgia, number 52, and he has done a really good job. He's been alternating with Tanner tonight. He was outstanding on that pass protection just a moment ago. Pressure gets the pass away. That one is caught by Leonard Pope, and he is shoved out of bounds at the 13 by Karibi Didi. How tough is the matchup for the Auburn linebackers on Leonard Pope? They're up there playing a lot of man to man coverage, trying to jam him at the line of scrimmage. 15 of 27, 222 yards, two touchdowns. Sixth game, over 200 yards this season. Thomas Brown back in the ball game at tailback. Shockley with the audible. Play clock, plenty of time there. Quarterback draw, ran into the defender. Hesitated for just a fraction, and that was enough for Marquise Gunn to grab a hold and knock him down. How much riding on this football game for Georgia? Keep in mind, if they win this game, they win the East Division of the Southeastern Conference, get a chance to play in Atlanta in the Dome in the Southeastern Conference Championship game. Of course, that's on December the 3rd. Look at total yards. 347, 343. Our ball game is a one-point contest. Everything very close and even tonight. Shockley drills it, complete to Pope, has the first down, and taking half the stadium with him to the five-yard line. Hobbs on the tackle. Again, the, the emergence of the tight end, Leonard Pope. Again, man-to-man -man coverage. He just breaks away on a little option route right there. Number 49, Kevin Hobbs. They're trying to get a safety up on him. Regardless of who they put on him, Ron, it's a tough matchup. <laughs> it's like, you know, flies swatting at the, at the big guy. Pitch back goes to Thomas Brown. Turns the corner at the five. Touchdown, Georgia. Bulldogs go back on top. That brought our guy out of the house. He saw that one, opened the door, and came out. Obviously a two-point situation right here for Georgia with the five-point lead. And one of the things, Ron, having an open date, as Georgia did last week, you have a lot of time to work on special situations like these two-point plays. So this will probably be a play that, that Auburn has not seen before. Martrez Milner, the additional tight end, comes out of the ballgame. They will go with two tailbacks. Thomas Brown, number 20, and Danny Ware, number 28. And that 25-second clock is ticked down to 10. Not a bad time to call timeout right here if you're Georgia. Going to have to hurry. Down to three. 
down to two. He doesn't see it. They just got a delay of Fair. game penalty. Wow. That's a major right mistake snap. right there. Delay of game. Offense. Penalty will be five yards. We'll retry. And Ron, I think the two-point conversion rate from the three-yard line is about 40% success rate when you get back to the eight yard line it goes to about a 10 percent percentage rate of success so they're going to kick the extra point that was a major major mistake right there for georgia not by georgia not calling timeout so mark rick wow Milner called the timeout. It has got another delay of game penalty. You get Milner right here, the second tie and end, 87. Burns the timeout. At some point right there, you're better off to just save the timeout, get a five yard penalty, because yeah. it's not going to make that much difference on the kick anyway. Katu attempting the extra point, and he got it. So let's take a timeout. 12.33 remaining in our ballgame. Georgia 27-21. Alabama loses. They're nine and one. Miami of Florida, eight and one. They won at Wake Forest today. Penn State idol, Virginia Tech idol. They're both one loss teams. And of course, Georgia down here, a one loss team. And the one game that they lost was to Florida, and they lost it without Shockley. And another team with one loss, Miami. The impact they made last week on ESPN against Virginia Tech, Ron. I thought I had five people ask me, how would Miami do against USC? Aroma Shadu takes it to the left. The flag is down, and he is stopped short of the 20-yard line. We're going to get a block in the back right there by Auburn. Well, let's check in for a Sports Center 30 at 30 update. All right, Ron, as you mentioned, Alabama knocked from the ranks of the unbeaten in overtime against LSU. Jamarcus Russell finding Dwayne Bowe in the end zone, and the Tigers win at 16 13. And the other SEC headliner, Steve Spurrier, leads South Carolina past Florida. Now, taking your cue, Ron, he got doused with the Gamecock aid. Sports Center coming up after the game. ESPN News never goes off of television. Okay, Greece, thank you. 12 27 left in the ballgame. Georgia leads by six. And we'll see just how big that delay of game turns out to be in this one. Quick pass. Aroma Shadu steps right out of bounds. Boy, you have to love the play calling of Al Borges. I mean, Auburn backed up with a first-year starter at quarterback. The crowd going crazy, anticipating run. And what a great little play-action pass. This guy's done a phenomenal job in two years at Auburn. Ron. I'll tell you what Borges said to, to us on the phone this week, which I thought was really a stand-up guy, a really tough statement to make. And he said, on the first game this year, he said, don't blame that on the freshman quarterback. He said, that was my fault. I went in a direction with plays we never should have been there. Don't blame him. Blame me. Straight ahead with the handoff. And they're going to pick up the first down. And, and a couple more. Kenny Irons on the carry. But that's a big statement and a tough statement for a coach to make. And, and the reason he said that is because they came out. Think back to that football game. Trey Smith was the starting tailback. They lose Cadillac Williams, Ronnie Brown. They thought they were going to be a quarterback-oriented team and throw the football because they have so many talented wide receivers at Auburn. But the sign of a great coach is to find your identity as the season goes on. And their identity, Ron, is run the ball first and play action second. No question about that now. Kenny Irons, the tailback, as Cooper Wallace goes in motion. And he'll give it to Irons. Left side, there's the hold. Has five, six, and seven. And counted off at very close to eight yards is Kedrick Goldston. 
obviously talked somebody into letting him back in the ball game because he just made the tackle. <laughs> How about that? Holly, you were right on it. He was begging everybody to get back on the field to play. Better watch David Pollock doesn't find a <laughs> helmet and jump back there on the field <laughs> as well. Quickly back to the line of scrimmage on a second down and short. Irons again. He's going to be tripped up short of the line of scrimmage. Mentor, number two, the senior out of Stone Mountain, Georgia, up from that cornerback position. Mentor is a guy that they talk about as you see an injury, and that's to Joe Cope, the center. Well, they've had a problem with that position as far as injuries. And Ron, they actually have played Troy Riddick in there some at center the offensive tackle keep in mind Joe Cope a walk on center has just had a tremendous year we're going to get a chance to see right here he's locked up with Goldston right there and he gets hit in the back and bent over that was a nasty looking bend back right there on the center quarterback center exchange Ron particularly in short yardage situations I believe it's Palmer 79, yeah, who was coming at center. Irons, left side, has the first down, plus about five. Tony Taylor on the tackle. And, Ron, I do believe it was Palmer, the offensive tackle, that played some center against Kentucky. Not Troy Riddick. As we look at Joe Cope over on the sideline, but big first down right there, particularly with the new center in the game. Big Jonathan Palmer, who you just got a look at, number 79, a junior out of Decatur. He is an electrical engineering major. Cox looking, still looking, going to go long. Far sideline, caught by Aruma Shadu and tackled by Greg Blue. 53 yards and Greg Blue is a run defender and right here they bring the corner fire and they get Aroma Shadu matched up on Greg Blue the big safety and really a poor job of the safety looking back and playing the football run but keep in mind that's not a corner who's nope. normally in that position and that's a big run free safety coming off a hamstring injury one of the points that the coaches made for Auburn very good against the run is blue not as good in in pass coverage particularly one-on-one -on -one. they got the matchup that they wanted irons headed for the sideline breaks one tackle lost the football you see the beanbags coming in georgia says they have it and the official still no signal still no signal keep in mind ron you can review if a fumble was caused, but you cannot review who recovers the fumble. Georgia football. Wow. Great effort by Kenny Irons. Let's look at it again. The football is clearly out. Only thing that can be reviewed, was it a caused fumble? It is a caused yeah. fumble. You Mentor. cannot review if the ball was recovered by Georgia or not. That will be Georgia's football. The Mario Mentor on the strip. Clearly a fumble. And Darius Swain, number 98, Ron, recovered that fumble. It's out. And Ron, that will be George's ball. You see Swain in there working it out. Darius, a senior out of Decatur, Georgia. Had a problem with a strained knee this year, and so now we wait for the replay. 
And if they're going to change it or say it stands as the call was made on the field. Ron, I don't think they can change it because it was clearly a fumble. And from that point on, it's a moot point because they signaled Georgia recovered the fumble. Boy, a great effort again by Kenny Irons and Demario Mentor right there knocks that ball out. You're going to see Big Swain coming in there at about 350 pounds. It's Jeff Owens, the freshman, yeah, actually comes out of there. Late. Boy, what a key, key turnover. Six-point Georgia lead. A little surprised, Ron, it's taken this long. Nine minutes and 47 seconds left in the ball game. Obviously, a huge play, whether it stays with Auburn or whether it goes to Georgia. After further review, Georgia did gain possession of the ball in play. So a costly turnover after what had been a costly delay of game against Georgia when they were going to try for a two-point conversion. Tanner comes back in the ball game at center, number 50. And it's Thomas Brown at tailback. Shockley. Well, he had Kenneth Harris there, but he overthrew him. Jonathan Wilhite was trying to cover and McClover had good pressure again and again Auburn jumping up there man-to-man -man, good pressure by McClover but it was straight man-to-man -man. Kenneth Harris the big freshman receiver on Jonathan Wilhite Auburn's corner Pressure again. Gets this one out to the fullback. Sutherland. Ball is on the turf, and it is picked up by a Didi. Didi. Touchdown. Auburn Tigers. And Marquise Gunn stripped the football, and Karibi Didi picked the football up. Obviously, this is reviewable as well. Did Sutherland have possession of this football before the ball was stripped? He did. It certainly appeared as though that, uh, that he did, yes. And how about Marcus Gunn, Ron, out there in pass coverage, the defensive end, and the Auburn defense gets it right back after Kenny Irons fumbled. Vaughn with the extra point attempt. He's perfect. Nine minutes, 28 seconds left in the ball game, and let's go to break. Our new score, Auburn 28 and Georgia 27. This college football primetime is presented by Polaroid. Log on to ESPN.com. Search Polaroid for a chance to go to the BCS National Championship. And in part by Suzuki. Introducing the all-new Gran Vitera, the authentic SUV. So welcome back to Athens, Georgia. We now have a total of two turnovers each and two touchdowns. And lead changes in the ball game. Six. Outstanding football game. You betcha. The 109th meeting between these two schools. Oldest rivalry in the South. It's a good kick right here. Very long. It's going to hit out of the back of the end zone by Clark. And Georgia will take it over at the 20-yard line. 
And David Gibbs given Georgia a lot of different looks. This is Marquise Gunn right here. And from a three-point stance, he's going to drop out of there on the zone blitz. Now, Brandon Sutherland in the flat. Marquise Gunn, who's a defensive end, strips the football out. And watch the athletic ability of Karibi Didi. That's a heck of a play and a huge turnaround right there. But if you're Georgia, put it all behind you because there's a lot of football left. You know, <laughs> and all these fans, this partisan house, one second they're thinking, hey, things are better. We just got that football back on a turnover and on the very first play, touchdown Auburn. Pass right over the middle. Got it complete. That's big Leonard Pope, and he hurdles the defender and picks up five more yards. How about that one, Big Leonard? 25 yards in the play. Reese Davis, let's go back to you. Well, Ron, if you leave a fumble lying around on the ground, as you guys just saw, people pick it up and run with it. Colorado and Iowa State, Lawrence Vickers puts it down. Steve Paris going the other way for the Cyclones to give them a 10-point lead. Colorado needs one more win, either this game or Nebraska, to go to the conference title game. First down, the line of scrimmage now at the 47. Shockley, whoa, okay. threw that one into coverage. David Irons out there to knock it down. If he had put up a second hand, might have made the interception. How about Leonard Pope, Ron? Let's go back to that previous play. He comes into this game with 19 catches. And I know right now there's a bunch of NFL people out there watching this game. Take this guy. This is his coming out party tonight. Eight catches, 102 yards. They might ask him to stop hurdling. Wow. But <laughs> he could leave that at home out of his repertoire. Well, he's a big man. He can really rumble with it when he gets it. Second down and 10. Shockley's pass to it right to the defender, and Will Height dropped it. Confusion on the part of Massaquai, the freshman. And the quarterback, Shockley. And miscommunication you mentioned right there. Massaqua is going to go down and run a little stop route. Shockley anticipates him to go down the field right here as Wilhite bails out. And Jonathan Wilhite, <laughs> David Gibbs, <laughs> you're exactly right. That was an interception right there. At a timeout, he's called by Georgia with this third down and 10. So let's go to break. 8.59 left in the ball game. Auburn with a one-point lead. Athens, Georgia, the place that they like to say, hey, come fight us be between the hedges. Well, right now, we've got quite a battle going on between the hedges. Auburn leads it by one, 28-27. And the Bulldogs with a third down and 10 at their own 45. Play clock is at five. Shockley gets the snap on two. Picked up the blitz well that time. Thrown across his body, and that one might have been intercepted. Thrown with the point of the football down and short. And Antarius Williams, number 31 on the blitz. DJ Shockley rolling to his left again. Marquise Gunn. And they move him to linebacker before this game's over. Fifth time to table to punt it tonight. Of course, Gunn being a defensive end, you wouldn't expect him to catch the ball quite as well, but he really had a good opportunity. Flowers is the deep man. Trey Smith, I beg your pardon. Here's the boot. Very high. And a fair catch is called for and made at the 22. Monday Night Countdown brings you all of the latest news and notes from around the NFL leading up to kickoff on Monday nights. Monday Night Countdown delivered by UPS, 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. And then join Al Michaels and John Madden in Philadelphia for a very important contest between the struggling Eagles and they need a win against the visiting Cowboys. Monday Night Football, 9 o'clock Eastern on ABC. Kenny Irons back in the ball game, 30 carries, 168 yards and two touchdowns. 
got the audible will take it straight up the middle and trying to guard the football a gain of only a couple holly Rowe, let's check with you Guys, Auburn center Joe Cope is not going to be able to return. He's got a sprained ankle and cannot go. In his place is Jonathan Palmer. He is a backup right guard. But, guys, keep in mind, Joe Cope is just a walk-on. Their regular starter, Stephen Ross, has been hampered all season by injuries. So they've been really smart. They have been getting Jonathan Palmer some snaps throughout this entire season, even in two-a-days this fall, to get him ready for a moment just like this. Okay, Holly, he was on the sideline during the timeout, rehearsing long snaps. This is a second down right here. Cox, good protection. Throws it out. Cooper Wallace, the tight end. And Wallace with the hurdle may have picked up the first down. Paul Oliver was there defensively. Auburn does such a great job, Ron, on these play action fakes. Watch right here on the play action. How they just sell it. You see right here the fullback coming in motion this way. And then the quarterback's going to come out of here on the boot. The misdirection play action is something they do a tremendous job of. So with the spotting of the football, they did not get the first down. Third and just inches. Straight ahead, Brandon Cox and the quarterback sneak behind the block of his center, Jonathan Palmer. And it's first down, Auburn. Tommy Tuberville would love to have right now just what they had to open this ball game. And that is a distance job that took over seven minutes off the clock. Right now they lead it by one, but that would be just what the doctor ordered. And you know, Tommy Tuberville said before the season, Ron, that this may be his most talented team at Auburn. Everybody thought he was nuts after the four first round draft choices they lost last year. But you see what he meant. This is a young, talented, talented Auburn team. On first down, play action again. Cox runs away from it. Now just going to throw this one away. In fact, Tommy Tuberville was the closest man to that pass. Jeff Owens, number 95, putting on the pressure. The thing you see is just how cool Brandon Cox is. I mean, there's times he looks like he's going to fall asleep a little bit back there in the pocket. Even on that play, Ron, I mean, he really has great, great patience at that quarterback position. One of the things that he scares his coaches with, worries them just a little bit, he stands in the pocket sometimes almost too long. He really is a gutsy kid. 14 of 24, 208, one interception. Well, that play was whistled down, and again, it's a situation. There is so much noise in this stadium. The kids are not able to hear the whistles. And Prior to the snap, false start, number eight on the offense. Penalty five yards. That remains set. Cooper Wallace, the tight end. That's the reason you see the officials sprinting in, getting the attention of the players, making sure nobody gets hurt on a hit on a play that's been called dead. I think Quentin Moses, the great pass rushing in from Georgia, also had Cooper Wallace's attention right there. <laughs> He's about ready to come off that corner, and Cooper had the pass blocking. 7.20 to play in our ball game. Auburn 28, Georgia 27. Cox with an audible. I think this crowd takes that as a personal challenge run when they try to change those plays. Straight ahead, and here's Irons. Not going to get back to the original line of scrimmage. It's going to be third down at about 13 yards. Mentor and Owens combining on the stop. Started to say a while ago, Mentor is one who has the great reputation with his coaches of spending a lot of time in the video room looking at video. They see as a real student of the game and one of the reasons he has improved so much. Here comes third down. Crowd will let you know if they get it or not. They got to go to the 41 and a half yard line. Keep in mind the backup center run as Brandon Cox calls time up. But you always get nervous with a center in the game, particularly in the shotgun, who's not played a lot of football. 
So six minutes and 34 seconds left in our ball game. Sanford Stadium, Athens, Georgia. Ron Franklin, Bob Baby, and Holly Rowe coming to you as we view the oldest rivalry of the Deep South, the 109th time that these two clubs have gotten together, and Auburn leads it 28-27. The Tigers have won nine of the last 11 trips into Athens, Georgia. And Ron, that is amazing when you think about the atmosphere in this stadium, but I go back to the point of Auburn having 18 players on their roster from the state of Georgia, and anytime guys get to come back home, play against people they played against in high school, that's a huge advantage because Georgia only with one player from the state of Alabama, which is really kind of interesting, but I think a testimony to the kind of high school football played here in this state of Georgia. There's a lot of players here. Yeah, I start to say a lot of players because you got more folks in Atlanta than you do the entire state of Alabama. Exactly. Georgia can clinch the East tonight if they can come away with a victory with that win by Florida today or by South Carolina over Florida. Third down. That's mix in motion. Cox is sacked way back at the 13-yard line. Ellerby, I think, is the man who will be credited with the sack. And they compared Daniel Ellerby to Thomas Davis, who was a first-round draft pick last year, kind of a kind of a defensive back, linebacker type guy. He's been injured, but you can see why you can see why Auburn tries to stay out of those long yardage situations. Interesting that they have moved the ball back up to the 15 and a half yard line, and that was clearly a fumble. Here's the boot, and they may have gotten a piece of it. It is very short and goes out of bounds around the 40-yard line. I think that Henderson is the man who got a hand on it, number 27, and caused only a 24-yard punt. So it's first down Georgia trailing by one and they get the great field position. Danny Weir is the man operating at tailback. Shockley rolls the pocket got it complete. And that is McClendon, number 16. Kevin Hobbs on the cover, but it's good for 14 yards. DJ Shockley on the sprint. And how about Brian McClendon, son of Willie McClendon? A great tailback here at Georgia. Brian McClendon has emerged in this football game, and that's been a sore spot this year for Georgia, the play of their wide receivers, Ron. Plenty of time on the play clock. Got single coverage. McClendon overthrew it. So here's the punt. And keep an eye on number 27. Auburn having gone with the rugby style punt, rolling out all night. He's been taking a lot of time. I don't think he I actually don't, got not, a piece of yeah, that. I'm huh? not sure he did get a piece of that one. He just had to rush because of the pressure, and he kicked it off the side of his foot. Pass interference, number 81 on the offense. Penalties 15 yards from the previous spot. Now remains one. Got an offensive pass interference on Big Leonard right there. Get another opportunity to see it right here. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh my. I don't think so. <laughs> Matched up on Will Herring, the safety. I mean, that's a reach right there, Colin. That, that's a bad call, Ron, in that situation. 
So they go with the draw play to Ware. And Ware will cut it back upfield inside the 35, and he's down to around the 33-yard line. Ron, that was a huge call, that offensive pass interference, because obviously it affects field goal position. We'll take a look at it again. You see Will Herring up there. Keep in mind, it's going to be offensive pass well, interference. Well, anything is defensive holding as well. I mean, that's a no call. That's a no call. That is a no call. I mean, Herring was doing what he should do, and that's grab a piece of the jersey if you can, unbeknownst to the officials. Pope and Milner in a two tight end alignment. Thomas Brown now is the man at the top of the eye. And he'll give it to him off the right side. Turns it up, finds a bit of daylight, and he takes it back to the original line of scrimmage, and it's going to be third down and ten. Irons on the stop. You said it. It just took the offensive pass interference penalty away, and they're right back where they started, which really impacts thinking one play ahead, field goal position. You have to think, Ron, Mohammed Massaqua right now, number one, or it looks like they're going to line up and run this football and play for field position. Third down and ten, two tight ends. That's exactly what they do right up the middle. Not much there for Thomas Brown. Williams on the defensive play. And you hear a few scattered boos from the crowd here. But the coaching staff and Mark Rick deciding that they'll play the percentages. Brandon Cattu with a very strong leg. And I think George is showing a lot of respect there for David Gibbs and Auburn's defense because Ron, Auburn has given him a lot of different looks. And this is huge. 41-yard attempt from almost right in the middle of the field. High pass from center. Got it away, and he split it. Lee Jackson, give him credit. Lee Jackson handled a very bad pass from center, got it down, and the kick is good. Watch this. And tremendous job. And how about Brandon Kutu? During the off week, Georgia coach Mark Brick informed him he would be put on scholarship starting in January. That's coming off his two misses against Florida. You talk about great coaching. Bring that guy in, Ron, after he misses two field goals in the Florida game. Put him on scholarship, and Kutu is paying dividends right now on that investment. So three minutes and 25 seconds left in our ball game, and in what has been a seesaw affair, seven lead changes now, Georgia 30 and Auburn 28. Sports Center coming up next. Immediately following this ball game, John Anderson and Scott Van Pelt. LSU against Alabama. Spurrier beats Florida and upsets this Saturday. So, Bob, the thing that you have to guard against <laughs> is what Al Borges and the Auburn Tigers have been able to do all night, and that is to take the football and advance it as well as anything, just rushing the football. And think about John Vaughn now, Auburn's place kicker, number 37, one for five against LSU. But this guy would love to have an opportunity to win this football game tonight. And it may very well, Ron, come down to John Vaughn. Two has the ball teed at the 35. Very long boot. Five yards deep. Trey Smith says we'll take it at the 20. And that scholarship he's been given has added some distance to those kickoffs as well. He's about ready to kick the thing out of the stadium. Yeah, he uh, he has been extremely extremely good tonight. And if you're Georgia right now, aren't you glad that South Carolina beat Florida? You're ahead. But you still have some margin for error, Ron, because this is a two-point game. It's going to come down to the wire. Kenny Irons again at tailback. Irons has got 173 yards on 32 carries. They fake it to him. They throw the pass. 
Obamano on the receiving end of that one, and it's about eight and a half yards on the completion. And that's a cool customer right there. I'm talking about Brandon Cox. Really is remarkable, Ron, how far he's come. And he has been in this situation before. Think back to Baton Rouge when they went into overtime with LSU. This is one cool guy for a young quarterback. Goldston back in the ball game. Kedrick wanted to play, and they finally said, okay, get in there. Here comes the run. Irons breaks one tackle, then good heavens. He gets sent <laughs> back the other direction. You talk about some leather exchanging here. And Greg Blue, who is called the big hitter on this team. And you didn't even have to see who it was. Watch Greg Blue. He is an explosive, wow. basically a linebacker playing back there at safety. 6'2", 214 pounds. First and 10, Auburn. Clock now under three minutes to play. Cox running out of harm's way. Here comes more pressure. It just throws this one away. Charles Johnson, number 99, was the guy coming with the pressure. And everybody in this stadium, Ron, held their breath because Greg Blue came in a little bit late and put a lick on the wide receiver over there on the sidelines. And what Johnson is gaining on him right there. Right there. I think an excellent no call though right there. Let him play this thing out. Crowd coming to life. And the crowd meter up on the scoreboard is showing between 100 and 102. 108 the loudest they can get. Here's Irons, nothing to the right, hit at the line of scrimmage, and he's gonna be driven back, and that's Gerald Anderson, the 315-pound senior. That's all the 315 pounds right there, but how about this atmosphere, Ron? It's about as good as it gets. Georgia right now playing for the East Division Championship of the Southeastern Conference. About 90,000 people going crazy, and it's third and long. Third down. They've got to take it out to the 45-yard line. Georgia leads it 30 to 28. Cox steps up. The left-hander zings it, and the ball is too tall and incomplete. Intended for Courtney Taylor. If you're Auburn, Ron, now you have to go for it. Two minutes and five seconds left, but you only have one timeout. In this place right now, you talk about the 12th man. It's right here in this stadium right now. Southeastern Conference East Division on the line right here, Ron. Two minutes and five seconds showing on the game clock. Brandon Cox stepping up, throws, got a man, and there he is, Aroma Shadu, and he's loose. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Auburn. Are you kidding me? Tremendous play by Paul Oliver late to punch that football out. 65 yards. Let's look at it. Aruma Shadu right here. Watch Paul Oliver strip it out. Now, does Auburn get possession of this football? Yes, yes. they did. Courtney, Courtney Taylor. Courtney Taylor, the senior wide receiver. That is a touchdown, and that was a fourth and ten conversion right there, Ron. Obviously, this is all reviewable. But it looked clearly to me that Paul Oliver punched the football out, but that Courtney Taylor recovered that football in the end zone for an Auburn touchdown. I think the question, the question that he's asking him, did he punch it loose 
before he was in the end zone. And if he did. That's not the same rules. Fumbling the ball forward, though. By rule, on fourth down, when the offensive team fumbles the ball and the ball goes forward, in this case it went in the end zone, we bring the ball back to the spot That's of the fumble. It's first down. Let's take another look at it. Obviously, you cannot fumble the football forward. He lost it at around the three-yard line. Courtney Taylor made the reception. You can't give him a touchdown, but it is good for 62 yards. And now Auburn will have it three yards away. And a fumble is a fumble, whether the ball is fumbled or obviously the ball caused to be fumbled, as in the case of Paul Oliver punching that football. Auburn still with one timeout, Ron. Clock runs. A minute, 45 seconds. Pitch back goes to Irons. Tries to turn the corner, and he is knocked down hard by Charles Johnson. Big Charles is there to make the hit along with Tony Taylor. And Auburn is in no hurry. Vaughn is warming up on the sideline if they score the touchdown or if they wind up running the clock all the way down and kicking the field goal. Exactly, and Georgia with two timeouts left in this football game. They will obviously use one of those timeouts after this play. Irons hit behind the line of scrimmage. Gerald Anderson this time. And you see Georgia signaling for a timeout. And they'll call it at 51 seconds showing on the clock. And Ron, I believe, yeah, that is Georgia's last timeout right there. Let's go back to that fourth and ten. Think of that. Georgia one play away from the Southeastern Conference East Division title. And Brandon Cox, excellent protection right here. He steps up in this window and throws a strike down the middle to a wide open Aroma Shadu. And now the football is going to be fumbled right here, punched out cannot fumble forward on fourth down but how about a wide open a room should do down the middle of that football field fourth and ten the crowd going crazy Paul Oliver knocked it loose Courtney Taylor got on it you heard the officials on fourth down can't fumble it forward so they got it at the three the final timeout called by the Bulldogs. 51 ticks showing on the clock. Georgia within a breath as they lead right now by two points. A clenching, a trip to the SEC championship. And right now, it is Auburn on the lip of the cup. Straight ahead, Irons. He'll take it to the two-and-a-half-yard line. Gerald Anderson again making the tackle. And now it is fourth down. Sports Center coming up immediately following our ball game, and Auburn's going to let this thing run all the way down. And it looks as though there is about seven seconds difference between game clock and play clock. So they can run it down to somewhere around 10, 9, or even 8 seconds left in the ball game. And I go back to the story of John Vaughn, one for five against LSU, heartbreaking loss in overtime. Tommy Tuberville comes in the office Sunday morning after going to church, and John Vaughn is out on the practice field kicking 10 footballs from every spot. He missed a field goal, and now this young guy, Ron, gets a chance for the ultimate redemption right here to beat Georgia. So they do call the timeout, and just as we had suspicioned, Eight seconds left on the clock. The smart thing to do. And of course, that is <laughs> if Auburn converts the field goal here. And it should be lined up. In fact, the ball is right at the line where an extra point 
he has attempted. And Ron, you go back to the Georgia touchdown when Mark Rick wanted to go for the two-point conversion. They let the clock run out, the five-yard penalty. They had to kick the extra point. But you also go back to South Carolina beating Florida today and some margin of error or for this Georgia football team because if they do lose, at least they get a chance next week against Kentucky to seal the East Division. Career from 20 to 29. Vaughn is 15 up 17. And you see, he's right in the middle of the field. And the operation, the snapper, the holder, to put yourself in the helmet right now and pretend you're John Vaughn. How about the pressure, even though it's basically an extra point? Here comes the extra point, what it looks like, but it's the field goal and it's the win. It would appear it is the win. We still got six seconds left on the clock, but the Auburn Tigers go back on top and a flag is down. Well, Marcus Brown, personal foul called on him. Roughing the kicker. And that penalty will be applied on the kickoff. We're going to see roughing the kicker right here. Right there. Wow. And how about Auburn and Tommy Tuberville, Ron, coming into this stadium? But how about fourth and ten? And Brandon Cox, the first-year starter, steps 62 up. 62-yard play. Unbelievable. And I'll tell you what. It's gone from as good as it can get to as bad as it can get in this stadium on one play. Well, we do have six seconds left. <clears throat> this kick is going to come from midfield following the roughing of the kicker with the 15-yard step off. Doesn't do much good to kick it, I guess, out of the end zone. They're still going to get it at the 20-yard line. Would you just kick it on the ground, Bob? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I might kick this sucker out of the end zone. Would you really? Because I always worry about all those throwbacks and yeah. that, that Stanford play. <laughs> I go back to that Stanford, the band play out there on the West Coast. I might take my poison with defense with six seconds left and one play left. Thomas Brown and Tyson Browning are the two deep men, but Georgia is looking for a squib kick. I think you do squib this football and make Georgia have some kind of miraculous kickoff return play to beat you. Well, let's see if they've, if they've got one in them. Nope, they're going to kick it away. You know why you do, Ron? There's no way to practice against something Georgia was about to do if you're yeah. Auburn. At least this situation, you can practice on defense. Well, a good look at center Joe Cope, who was injured, had to go out of the ballgame. Jonathan Palmer came in, did a very nice job replacing him. But Aroma should do, as we said, even in the starting lineups uh, tonight. He has become such a big play guy on both kick returns and also as a wide receiver. A really dangerous guy. And you see the deep, deep positioning of the secondary of the Auburn Tigers. They'll let him throw it underneath, but nothing long. Shockley. Clock is run out. Still looking. Drills it. Has it complete. Massaquai, and this one is over. The Auburn Tigers have just won again here at Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. This time by one point. 31 to 30. And that look on that young lady's face really just about says it all. The great thing, though, for Georgia, if they can beat Kentucky, they will represent the East in the Southeastern Conference Championship. And South Carolina still alive, Ron, in the East race. Let's go down to the sideline. Holly Rowe is with Coach Trevorville. Holly. Coach, after everything that happened at LSU, what was going through your mind on that last kick from John Vaughn? Well, you know, you, you we, we try to think positive, but, you know, when when... 
what happened last few weeks ago. You know, you felt for the kid, but he uh, he made up for it tonight. Also, it's fourth and ten. You go for it, and Brandon Cox with the strike. How did your young quarterback perform under this pressure? Well, you know, they fortunately for us, they didn't try to pressure him. They tried to play zone. When he plays zone, you know, he kind of picked it apart. You know, we got a guy open. You know, it's, it's a fun game. Both teams play good. Georgia's a good football team. We played good tonight. Why is it that the visiting team seems to have the edge in this rivalry? I don't know, but uh, maybe we can come back again next year. They won't come to our place. All right. Congratulations, Thanks. Coach. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, Holly. Now here's a look at our Polaroid image of the game. It's the game winner by John Vaughn. And as we said on the air, as it happened live, it looked like an extra point, but it was a field goal attempt. And Auburn had run the clock down to eight seconds. They kicked the field goal to win it by one. Final score, Auburn 31 and Georgia 30. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Sports Center coming up next over on ESPN News. It's post game, post game extra. Now for Bob Davey, Holly Rowe, and our entire crew, I'm Ron Franklin. Good night, everybody, from Athens, Georgia, as the Tigers of Auburn have come from behind and won a really close one. Good night, everybody.